Clifford, can we start with a roll call, please? Commissioners Chen. Present. Lo Palato. Present. Reed. Present. Vice Chair Shabazz. You're muted, but I saw you mouth present. <laughs> Presente. And Chair Tilos. Here. Five present. Okay, do we have any oral communications? We do not, nobody has raised their hand. Okay, so I guess the next order of business is a 3A, the minutes of the March 1st, 2021 meeting. Um, commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I see hands up. Commissioner Chen. Uh, it's just the spelling. Um, one of the speakers name was misspelled the first time she was mentioned on page five. Her name is uh, Amy Gonglu and not Erin. Oh, thank you. I'll fix that one. She's, she's not Irish. <laughs> okay, I saw Commissioner Reed that you had your hand up quick, then it came down. Did you have a question? Um, yes, I just had a brief comment. I think uh, when I read when I read through um, the minutes at the very end, uh, it mentioned uh, as uh, as Laura was closing the meeting. Um, I think she mentioned me, and I'm not sure if it was it was relevant to me or to someone else. Um, but I believe that I had stated that I was going to submit comments for the um, uh, for the null and void remedy. Okay, Commissioner Lopalata. Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually just had some really tiny edits that I emailed over to um, the clerk's office, but I can share them here in the interest of openness. Um, very quickly on the, looks like it's page 13, as we were transitioning topics, um, I just added in some clarifying language where it sort of jumps straight from the um, the police reform presentation to uh, and racial equity committee to sort of talking about the null and void and the timing. So um, I just went back and listened to it and, and made some minor edits to that. Do I, do I need to read the edits themselves? Yeah, sure, Is if you better? read them, okay. that's perfect, yeah. Okay, um, and um, Commissioner Shabazz, this mentions you, so please feel free to weigh in if you disagree with any statement. It, uh, so I would change the paragraph that says in response to Commissioner Shabazz's inquiry to say, Commissioner Shabazz raised a point of order proposing that based on time and the timing of receipt of Commissioner Lopalato's proposal for item 3D, that Commissioner Lopalato's proposal regarding the null and void remedy could be addressed at a later date. Commissioner Lopalato said yes, stated that she anticipated that, stated the long range solution while it can be packaged with item 3D's discussion regarding replacement of the null and void remedy was in addition to other topics being discussed. So she is okay with re-agendizing it or handling it at a different meeting. Um, just sort of clarifying some of the nature of how our item got kicked over. Um, there are other places, just a spelling note about um, private right of action is spelled R-I-T-E throughout. I, I made a correction on that. Um, and then there is a statement where the chief assistant city attorney, this is on page 14, is, I believe on 14, clarifying about the nature of the draft decisions. And it is the paragraph near the bottom of the page. I just added in some language from the actual transcript that was missing, which was clarifying that the draft decision is prepared by one side. Uh, with the hopes the commission would re reach that decision, um, which clarifies the process a little bit better, I think, for the public. I think that was it. That was the ones you sent me. Perfect. Vice Chair Shabazz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening and peace be with you all. Um, I had one uh, clarification also um, 
prior to uh, recusing myself, um, I stated that I was invited to uh, be a part of the Jackson Park renaming committee. And so I just wanted to clarify the reason why I stated that I was recusing myself. Uh, and with that, I'd move approval of the minutes from the March 1st meeting. All right, we have a motion from Vice Chair Shabazz. Do we have a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Chen. Madam Clerk, can we do a vote? Commissioners Chen. Yes. Lo Palato. Aye. Reed. Aye. Shabazz. Aye. Chair Tilos. Aye. That carries by five eyes. That is great. Okay. We're going to head right on to 3B here in Los Sunshine Ordinance complaint filed by Scott Morris on May 12th, 2020. And we are uh, promoting uh, Mr. Scott and uh, some Kristen Rogers, who's uh, representing the city, and Alan Cohen and Jeff Emmett. And uh, they are all here now. Okay. Are there any recusals at this time? Vice Chair Shabazz? Yeah, peace. I have a, a point of order. Uh, so I just want to clarify, uh, I was, uh, it was suggested by staff of the city's attorney's office that I recuse myself. Um, I can speak a little bit more in depth later um, about some of the timeline, but essentially after seeing uh, Mr. Morris uh, express concerns via Twitter publicly about uh, not receiving some of these documents, I suggested in April uh, of 2020 that he file a complaint with the Open Government Commission. Uh, additionally, after our meeting uh, last month, or excuse me, in February, upon seeing that, um, uh, assuming that Mr. Scott was the one who was the person to voluntarily, uh, what do you call it, voluntarily suspended, I did a Public Records Act uh, to get those emails. And so, uh, again, I just wanna share that uh, to be very public, that uh, I did uh, see this uh, have, I, ha I was concerned about this issue enough to do a Public Records Act request to see what happened after our last meeting. Uh, but I will make impartial decisions based upon the facts that are presented here and the information that I've also reviewed. So just wanna be forward uh, with the city attorney's office uh, sharing with me, they believe that I should recuse that I'm not recusing, but I will make impartial decisions this evening. Okay, with that, I think it's time for our Chair, presentation. Chair Tilos? Yes. yes. Um, I just wanted to make a brief uh, statement regarding uh, Commissioner Shabazz's um, comments. Um, I was the person from our office who did advise Commissioner Shabazz that it was our legal opinion that he recuse himself and I did want to give a little bit more context to um, some specifics um, of the basis for our recommendation. And that has to do with the fact that um, um, Commissioner Shabazz, as he just mentioned, did in fact indicate to, or recommend to, I would, I would characterize it to, commission, uh, to Mr. Morris that Mr. Morris file a complaint with the OGC. Um, specifically, he indicated on Twitter to Mr. Morris, quote, I know a commissioner, LOL. And it is our opinion that that comment suggested to Mr. Morris that Commissioner Shabazz would be a receptive audience to Mr. Morris's complaint and that it went beyond just giving information to the public about the complaint process. And I'm informing the entire commission of the basis for our advice to Commissioner Shabazz because of the fact that um, should this body take action regarding Mr. Morris's complaint and should that action uh, be reviewed by a court, courts do find and do examine the uh, presence of the um, or the propriety of recusals and whether recusals um, were made um, 
or not. And in this case, uh, we believe that the opinion or the decision handed down by this commission this evening on Mr. Morris's complaint could be imperiled or or weakened on a judicial review because of the fact that Mr. Sh or Commissioner Shabazz um, has a basis for recusal. So that those are my um, comments on that. As I informed Mr. Shabazz, he and I had a cordial back and forth by email. I indicated to him that it is his decision to recuse himself or not. I did indicate, and I agreed, or I indicated that that was his decision, or he indicated to me that that was his decision not to recuse himself, and that I wanted to clarify the basis for our office's opinion. Okay, um, Madam Clerk, um, in regards to this, if we have recommendation from the city and a commissioner decides that they don't want to recuse themselves, what's the usual policy there? Is it up to the other commissioners or do we just go on? What, is there any, um, you know, things, do we vote on this? That we force someone to recuse themselves or is it just their decision? Um, I don't think that there's anything specifically in the bylaws uh, directing it, but let, let me double check really quickly um, well, I think Commissioner Shabazz raised his hand and then I can see if there's anything there quickly. Great, Commissioner Shabazz, Vice Chair Shabazz. You're on mute. Also, I got so much going on over here in life. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, yeah, uh, as I wrote in that tweet, I've known uh, Chair Teo since I was a child. Nonetheless, um, as we get into the actual discussion today, uh, we can talk more about some more uh, information. I just wanted to actually um, note that one, in response to your question, I believe the bylaw states that someone should uh, state what the concern is, and then it, you can continue, but that can be verified. And then actually just as a point of personal privilege is uh, preparation for Ramadan this evening. I'll be um, briefly stepping away from the uh, computer to uh, break fast, but I will be joining us for this uh, discussion this evening. Yeah, I just briefly looked through the bylaws and, and didn't see, you know, any any direction, specific direction on it. So, um, yeah, it's not okay. in there. Then, all right. Commissioner Lopalata. Actually, um, I have two questions that pertain to all complaints that I think might be beneficial just to ask of the city attorney's office before we launch into the, the multiple complaints we have on calendar today, if that would be okay with you. Yes, please. I think, you know, so it doesn't seem as if it's, you know, pertaining to any one specific complaint. This is something um, first that I don't know that we resolved in our last meeting and that is the exact verbiage we should be using when we're evaluating uh, the nature of complaints. Is it a binary between we are sustaining a complaint or finding it unfounded or is it a complaint is sustained or you know, it has merit, does not have merit or it's unfounded? Just if we could get some clarity on that before we even begin thinking about all of this. Of course. Um, um... Based on, on the text of the Sunshine Ordinance, it, it is not a binary in that there are only, there are no, it is not only two options because you can uh, find that a complaint has been, that you sustain the complaint, it has merit. So that's one option. There would be another option where after an examination of the facts, there is a vote that the complaint um, does not have merit, but it is, and so it is not sustained. And then there is yet a third option where you find you make a, a decision that it is unfounded. And I believe that, and, and so that was the, for instance, the um, conclusion of the voting commissioners during the March meeting uh, for that particular complaint. And as, as I think we discussed at that meeting, there is um, no definition within the Sunshine Ordinance of unfounded. So it is a, a definition that, um, uh, you as a um, as a body need to make on, on each on each complaint, but it is um, and there are ramifications to a um, complainant having two unfounded complaints within a time frame that I think Mr. Foreman indicated last year or last month. Excuse me. 
Thank you. That's helpful. And my other question, um, because relating to our, our written agenda materials, um, I think it would be really helpful for commissioners and for the public to have a better sense of the sort of authorship and purpose of each of the documents that are enclosed with our agendas. I'm hopeful we can, we can talk about that later, fixing that going forward. Um, but at least for the purposes of this evening, um, you know, as things roll in, the attachments get a little bit muddy. And so I'm wondering if perhaps either the chief assistant city attorney or city clerk can give us some specificity with respect to what we've reviewed for tonight um, and what's available on the agenda for these items to see sort of who they came from, what their purpose is. Of course, I'll, I'll take the first crack and then I'll, I'll look to our city clerk to round out that explanation. Um, basically, both sides in each complaint have the option to present their written arguments um, and submit that in a form that is included with the, the packet that gets published and then sent out to you all a week prior to the hearing or to the meeting. And so that those written communications, those written arguments sometimes um, can really take any form as you have seen in um, the complaint that was filed last month, as well as two complaints filed this month, the written um, argument that is submitted on behalf of the city is, uh, appears more legal in nature. And that is because the city has retained outside counsel, meaning attorneys, to submit a written argument on behalf of the city in each of the three complaints, the two this evening, as well as the one back in March. And so, and, and then of course the complaining party, the complainant also has um, the right and, and oftentimes does submit something in writing. Um, it does not need to take any particular form. It's something and that um, um, is something also that can be attached. Another document that you did see last month and you're seeing this month as well is something that would be um, perhaps titled um, proposed decision suggested decision. Um, it looks a lot like it's the form of the document is, um, it looks like a final decision of the OGC. Um, that, is, that is prepared in all three cases that we've talked about last month and the two this evening. It's prepared by outside counsel. So it is, um, it is the conclusion that the city um, special counsel is urging, but it is not a um, requirement that the commission needs to agree with. It's, it's basically their, their wish list of the way that they hope that you um, decide, but you're not in any way bound to decide in that um, format. And um, yes, so perhaps the city clerk has um, more to add to my explanation. Sure, I can, I can provide just a little bit further history that the city has always um, prepared that draft decision and presented it to the commission uh, for every, going back to every single case. And, and I think the city has just done it um, since, uh, you know, we staff the commission and therefore uh, it gives the commission a starting point. Uh, the commission has many times done the take, or at least a couple of times taken the exact opposite than what was in the decision. So the decision is, you know, completely draft. And um, I think going forward, we can make it more clear when we attach it in the packet that's saying, um, you know, this is just being presented as a starting point and, or, you know, something very clear in the language that uh, makes it understandable that, you know, it is, it is, not finalized it is not you know it is just the recommendation from the city side as a starting point thank you and um i think maybe the only other clarifying point there is the document that is a staff report you know it's listed as staff report it comes under the same heading as where we see staff reports for all of our other guiding things that's actually a statement by special counsel in both of these cases right that's not the staff's recommendation or the, or the chief assistant city attorney's framing of the issue, that is an advocacy piece. That's a position statement by the attorneys representing the city in this adversarial adjudication. Is that right? I, I saw the city clerk nodding, so I, I um, wasn't sure if she was going to comment, but that, um, <laughs> um, yes, it is an adversarial piece. I am, um, it's, um, the waters are a bit muddy just because um, it is also the city's position. So it's the city advocating, but I, um, um, so it is an advocacy, it is both an advocacy piece and 
in this particular instance, the position of the city, um, the particular department within the city in this, uh, such as last month, uh, the parks and rec, sorry, the recs and park division uh, department, so. And the same is, I would say, the city has always presented the staff report from its viewpoint, and um, it, traditionally, it's always been done that way, um, and that has always been this, the city's side as well. Thank you. Okay, we had Commissioner Reed's hand up for quite some time, so I'll go to her first. Thanks so much. Um, so I just wanted to add to... Um, to that conversation a little bit. Um, so I was also wondering um, why uh, why the staff and the special counsel prepare a decision before we've actually heard heard um, heard a case. And so I understand um, what you what uh, what the clerk said that it's been common practice. And I'm just wondering if that's something that the OGC wants to continue with, or is that something that we can decide as a commission? that we want or that we don't want. And, um, and I'm also wondering if, the, if in those staff uh, decisions or those, pre you know, those prepared decisions, have they ever held the position of uh, sustaining a complaint? So I think that would be something important for us to know if, uh, if this practice is, is going to continue in this way. And um, the second item that I'd like to, uh, to mention is, as we begin um, to hear this case um, uh, for Mr. Scott Morris, um, since he specifies uh, the California Public Records Act, um, and uh, so we, you know, since we have members of the public, I was wondering if the city attorneys could please read um, the specific section that he, that he mentioned in his, um, in his complaint. I believe it's, uh, it's section, if I wrote it down correctly, 6253C. Uh, so I just thought that we could, um, is that right? Or 6250. Um, so I was hoping that that could be read to the public before uh, before hearing the complaint. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Breed, thanks for bringing up the points in regards to if other commissioners would like to continue that practice. I think we could address that under com um, commissioner communications so we could you know get to these two complaints that we have now. I think at the maybe after we have hearing on both sides if we still need to have um, the, um, your, the reading of that um, municipal code, we could ask for that too. So maybe in the meantime, while we're hearing these complaints, uh, someone on the city side could look for that municipal code and we could ask for that reading at that time. Um, we had Commissioner Chen raise her hand, so let's take her comment. Before yes, we I, um, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, I concur with Commissioner Reed about um, the, it seems like the deck is already stacked <laughs> to uh, to uh, reject the complaint from the very get go. And my understanding of the Open Government Commission is that we and this forgive me, I've been sitting in a jury <laughs> pool <laughs> listening to the judge and the attorneys for eight hours. So uh, we're told to have an open mind when, when the uh, case is presented to us. And so to have the staff report, which already says, yeah, they complained about this, but we fixed it already, blah, 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 right? And it's not until like the third or fourth document that I actually see the complaint. Um, so it, it seems like it's not a fair process for the, for this, for the, for the uh, residents who go to the trouble of filing a complaint at, to have all of these opposing documents in the beginning and then to already have our opinion written. It just seems like a stacked deck. So I'm just, I'm just concerned just looking at the way all of the documents came flying at us. It wasn't until I saw Mr. Morris's uh, statement that I actually understood <laughs> what was going on. So um, I, 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 this is for a further discussion, but I wanted to concur with Commissioner Reed on that. Yeah. I, 
I think, um, I don't know if uh, the chief assistant city attorney can add anything, but I mean, I think we hear you guys and I think we can come back with a different format next time with a, a more neutral staff report and with the two opposing sides attached and the one, you know, the side that's the city side could have their proposed, uh, you know, possible, uh, you know, decision attached to that. And then, you know, we can just, we can format it differently going forward. I think we've heard. So I think, I think it's clear and perhaps uh, Elizabeth wants to add something. Sure. I, I think I think um, I, I concur with um, Madam Clerk that we can continue the discussion to clarify this. And I will just emphasize the fact that the proposed decision that was submitted in this case um, in both complaints by the special counsel, that is, again, as I said, um, that is the way that they're advocating. They're doing their job to advocate their side. The other side is, of course, open to um, preparing their own um, dream um, decision as well. And I will just say it, it is something that is um, probably just force of habit for attorneys. Um, when attorneys file motions in court, um, requests it for court, um, typically what both sides will do is prepare a proposed order, like a proposed decision. And that again is the way that that attorney is urging the, in that case, judge to, um, to conclude. And so I think that's most likely why attorneys tend to prepare proposed decisions. Um, and I'm sorry that it, it may seem as if it's stacking the deck, but it's truly an advocacy piece um, because that's, that's what they're advocating for. The other side of course is free to advocate uh, and does advocate um, their own. It just doesn't look the same. So, but I appreciate the comments and we'll work with Madam Clerk to clarify the process as appropriate. Okay, are we ready to start? Okay, I don't I'll, I'll see any more hands up. Okay, so now, um, Scott Morris, thank you for joining us and we're ready for your presentation. Okay, thanks for all for having me. Um, so I'm here to tell you about my experiences uh, seeking public records in the city of Alameda. Um, the city's brief, it points out that I received the records that are requested and that's true. And I'm not going to argue about whether a specific violation of any sunshine ordinance remains here. But my interactions with the city attorney's office were really bad. And I think the city is maybe bullying and lying to anybody who seeks their right to public access. Um, I thought it's important for you to hear about it. I am a professional journalist. I have been since 2011. Um, I've been published in just about every paper, TV station in the region. Um, I did the last year for a year long investigative project for ProPublica. And so I've submitted Public Records Act requests at hundreds of agencies all over the state. Um, so in this particular case, I made a request in April 2020 seeking three months of arrest data, um, which is specifically identified as releasable under California Government Code 6254F1. Uh, I used the language of my request taken directly from statute. Uh, and the city only agreed to provide 30 days of information and cited an appeals court case in Los Angeles um, from 1993, which said that agencies were only required to release contemporaneous arrest information. I argued that the case law was outdated. There was a more recent ruling that contradicted it. Uh, the city released 30 more days of information, and then, um, but it was still short of fulfilling my 90-day request. Uh, so I opened this complaint. Um, the city released 30 more days and asked me to close the complaint, but I said that, you know, the policy as it stands uh, contradicts, is contradicted by California state law. And so um, I said that I wouldn't withdraw this complaint until the city changed its policy. Um, the city stands by that position, apparently, um, and said it doesn't need to release more than 30 days of arrest data wrote that the Alameda Police Department's current policy is to release only 30 days contemporaneous arrest records. This policy is generally consistent with policies from other California police agencies and judicial guidance. Um, moreover, this policy appropriately balances the public's right to information with the privacy rights of persons arrested and is reasonable in light of the police department's limited staffing resources. The policy is not consistent with other area police departments. Um, at the same time that I submitted this request, I submitted the same request to 12 other police departments in Alameda County. Only the city of Alameda County, only, only the city of Alameda denied my request on these grounds. 
Um, in fact, the city relies on language that's been written out of the statute. The law specified that the current address of arrestees be released, but the legislator am legislature amended that statute in 1995 and removed the word current address from the statute. Um, so there's no indication in the te text of the law that only contemporaneous records could be released. And the city acknowledges that the 2015 case contradicts this one, but says that only calls for service are unlimited, which is the same section of statute. And so it still limits arrests, but not calls for service, apparently. Um, and while the city would have you believe that it's trying to protect privacy rights with this policy, um, the CUSAR decision that it cites doesn't mention, discuss privacy rights. It's not an issue in that. It's, it's, that's just a made up reasoning for why it's, and it uses that decision to um, justify it. And frankly, the city's shown no regard for privacy in these proceedings. Um, in filing exhibits, the city put my personal email address, cell phone number, and home address on a public agenda. Um, and so as a journalist, in the last year, I've covered organized crime, I've covered far right movements, and I've received threats and actually take steps to hide my um, address. And I had to come back and demand that the city remove it from this agenda. Uh, so the city's interactions with me just aren't in good faith, in my opinion. Um, and in phone calls, Assistant City Attorney Alan Cohen acknowledged to me that the decision that he cited likely was contradicted and had agreed to work on a new policy. And it was only when I agreed to a proposal that he had said, and I said that I would temporarily suspend this complaint. Um, and he wrote to me confirming that you agreed to put the OGC complaint on hold for 30 to 60 days while you and I work together on a retention disclosure policy. That was on May 18th of last year. That's the last I heard from him on this issue. And then now the city's response is just that they were correct all along, that they never apparently had any intention of developing a new policy. Um, and the city's just doubled down on that. So the city says that you should just disregard my complaint because I received the records, but insists that it could deny another requester on the same ground. And a less savvy person, a person that's less savvy with public records law would potentially just believe them. Um, but I don't think the position is correct. I think the policy needs to be changed. And, you know, I think the city's own lawyers here are needlessly exposing it to liability just because they want to be stubborn about this. Um, so, you know, the city of Alameda, in my opinion, from what I've experienced with it, starts from a position of obstruction. But in California, there's supposed to be an assumption of disclosure, and the city is not following that. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Okay, it looks like it's um, time for Kristen Rogers to give a presentation on behalf of the city. Thank you, Chair Telos, and good evening, um, honorable commissioners. It's very nice to be here um, and to see your faces. Um, I think this is pretty clear cut. Our papers make it clear. And in fact, Mr. Morris seems to agree um, in the first paragraph of his statement uh, filed in support of his complaint, he concedes there is no sunshine ordinance violation. That was the sum total of his complaint, was that there is a sunshine ordinance violation and he's conceded that there is none. The city has provided him every document, every piece of information that he requested. And the job of this commission right now, as you are seated here, as we are all together, is to decide whether there was, whether there is a violation of the sunshine ordinance. There just hasn't been as Mr. Morris agrees. So at this point, what we have is a claim that his request was improperly denied, but it wasn't. And the complaint is therefore unfounded. Now we're all here together tonight to provide Mr. Morris an opportunity to be heard. And that is important. At the same time, it is important to recognize the, the duty right now of this commission uh, as assembled with respect to this particular complaint is to decide whether there is a Sunshine Ordinance violation. And there's just not. Um, nonetheless, Mr. Morris is pursuing his complaint anyway, and there is no basis for it. So his decision to pursue it is consuming yet more public resources. Um, a, a procedural point that I believe was raised earlier, but wanted to um, crystallize for the purposes of the record here. One member of this commission, um, Council Member Chavez, um, reached out to Mr. Morris and 
solicited this very complaint a year ago. Uh, and the city respectfully objects to uh, the commissioner's continued participation in this matter. Um, it is a fundamental precept of our system of government, as Commissioner Lopalato noted, as Commissioner Chen noted, that there be fairness, as Commissioner Reed, I believe you, bre you brought this up as well, that there be fairness in these proceedings. Um, and fundamental to that principle is that decision makers in this adversarial proceeding must be fair and impartial. Um, the lack of a fair hearing uh, raises constitutional due process concerns by depriving the parties here, the city of that fair hearing. Um, and the doctrine is the common law doctrine of bias. So in addition, the partition or the participation of a biased decision maker uh, cast doubt on the impartiality of the decision and the integrity of this process. And so the city just would like to formalize its objection to the, the participation of Commissioner Shabazz. Um, as I said already, there is no merit to this complaint at this time, and that's where the commission's inquiry should end. Um, but to justify the continued prosecution of a complaint that Mr. Morris concedes has no merit, uh, Mr. Morris now is uh, using this forum, this time, to complain about the city's 30-day policy of disclosure of arrest records. Um, that policy, however, is rational and appropriate, and it's consistent, consistent with the city's obligations under the law. So first, case law does support the city's policy, and the CUSAR case remains good law for the point that the interpretation of Government Code Section 6254, Subdivision F1, is subject to a contemporaneity requirement. The case that uh, Mr. Morris cites as uh, conflicting authority is in fact not conflicting. It was specifically interpreting a different subdivision, uh, subdivision F2, which relates to citizen complaints and requests for assistance. Um, and the Frederick's court specifically noted that although there is a contempt, that there is a uh, that basically <laughs> the information that is subject to uh, F1 may have different policy concerns that would necessitate a contemporaneity requirement. And it left untouched the CUSAR courts holding uh, applying a contemporaneity requirement to arrest information. So it is therefore unsurprising that several of our sister jurisdictions have a 30 day policy uh, for arrest records. And although I'm sure Mr. Morris was able to obtain the records he wanted, that does not undermine the fact that there may be, that our research is that there is a 30-day policy in sister jurisdictions. And perhaps like Alameda, um, those jurisdictions simply complied in full with the request um, in a showing of good faith and in an attempt to be transparent um, and to give Mr. Morris what he wanted, which is precisely what the city did here. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to touch on something that I think really is uh, worth mentioning. There is a real privacy interest at play here. And I think Mr. Morris has attempted to undermine it, but it, but it, it is something that we, we must um, give full credit to in this conversation. Um, people who are arrested are private individuals. It could have been a, mis a case of mistaken identity, someone matching a suspect's description. It could have been a mistake. Um, and there is a privacy interest for those private individuals to be able to have their names separated and, and for that record not to follow them for their entire lives. In many cases, charges are not brought, no indictment, no further action. It's their individual private name associated with potentially a mistake on the part of law enforcement or a mistake on their own behalf. And, and they have every reason to believe that those records from long ago cannot be unearthed. So any Public Records Act request under the Government Code Section 6255 is subject to a balancing test. It's the backstop. Is the public interest better satisfied by disclosure or is the public interest better satisfied by a continued, by, by exempting and not and withholding the records. So here, what we also have to consider are the limited resources of a burdened public agency 
the department, right? Every time these records are being requested, they have to scan through and ensure that juvenile information is redacted, that um, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence who are on the registry, uh, that their identity is not disclosed, that that is deleted and omitted from the production. Um, and then of course, they also have to consult expungement records to make sure that folks who have been able to get, you know, their arrest records expunged, as many people should be able to have done that, that those records are not included in the document production pursuant to a public records act request. And so what that, what that all leads to is the conclusion that if there is a, a limitless ability to obtain arrest records, if there is not a rule of reason balancing the public interest in disclosure versus the public interest in withholding and in accounting for the individual's privacy interest, then what we have is a system where there is actually a real problem um, based on this access to justice gap, which I know you guys have probably all heard of before, but it's basically the case that if you don't have resources, you don't have access to get that expungement and you won't have the access to advocate on your own behalf and your name will be the one forever linked to a potential mistake or a total accident, or just because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So those who will be impacted by an unlimited ability to dig into arrest records are probably those least well off and those who least have the resources to be able to defend themselves in that instance. And so the department's policy and the city's position is eminently reasonable and compliant with law. But back to the real task at hand here, the question is whether there's a sunshine ordinance violation. And as Mr. Morris has conceded, there's not. He got everything that he wanted. And that should end this, this inquiry this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I see a hand raised. So at this point, I'll take questions from commissioners. I see Vice Chair Shabazz's hand up. And I do not hear you. So I had this double muted uh, thing to make sure I don't say what I'm often thinking. But my facial expressions are fairly transparent. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Morris, for your presentation. And um, uh, Ms. Rogers for your um, your comments as well. Um, just to clarify, this is for uh, just technical clarifying questions and then we'll have public comment and discussion, correct, Mr. Chair? Yes, after um, questions from commissioners, I'll ask the clerk if we have any public speakers. Okay, awesome. Yeah, just as a clarifying question, um, I know at the uh, heart of this is a question about the Sunshine Ordinance and particularly the Public Records Act. Um, the Public Records Act states that uh, someone has, uh, the city is supposed to respond uh, within uh, 10 days. Could uh, you clarify whether that is 10 calendar days or uh, 10 business days? Thank you. Was that question to me? Uh, well, you know, I did a whole presentation with you on the Public Records Act, but whoever uh, from uh, the city would be able to clarify that with the legal fortitude that I lack. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's 10 days. It's not business days, it's calendar days. Thank you for that clarification. Vice Chair Shabazz, I know I just called on you, but your hand never went down. Are you done with your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. I will lower my hand. Okay. Commissioner Lopalato. Thanks. Um, I have uh, a couple questions uh, for each side here. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and just clarify, actually, uh, for Mr. Morris, uh, you you noted that you had submitted the same request to 12 other departments in our county. Um, and I wanted to just confirm, did each of them uh, give you the full time frame of the documents that you sought, Or is it just that they gave you more than the city of Alameda did? Uh, each of them gave me the 
full time frame of the documents, uh, except for um, Alameda County Sheriff's Office and the Oakland Police Department, neither of which appropriately responded to my request at all. Uh, and that's actually the subject of a litigation right now with the city of Oakland. Okay, thanks. And um, was there ever, uh, there's, there's some mention in, um, I think in your statement about, uh, you know, sort of where this contemporaneous limitation comes up. Um, and I guess I wanted clarity on that. Is that, uh, is this notion of limiting it to contemporaneous as to like a specific look back period, something that, um, that, that you've seen in the statute that was written out or is it, that's purely like from case law? It was, there was, um, the way it, it happened was it, there used to be, there, it, the, the statute at issue has um, kind of a list of things that the city must deliver with regards to each, each arrest. Um, and it used to be that current address was included in as part of that. Um, and then that was, uh, and based on that, the, um, a court of appeals in Los Angeles uh, interpreted the legislative intent of the law to be that they only for a limited period of time, but it didn't really define what that would be. And, and it, it was only supposed to be what was reasonable. Um, but then the legislature actually changed that in um, 1995, they removed that current address. So there's nothing that has any kind of temporal um, def definition at all in that section of the law anymore. Uh, and so, you know, year, years later, there was a different decision and they looked at um, the directly subsequent section of that statute, which defines a list of things that um, they have to release about every time a police officer goes somewhere. And current address was also lift, re removed from that part of it. And so they looked at this previous decision, um, the same one the city is relying on. And they said, well, since this uh, language was removed, this doesn't apply for anymore. And there's no reason to interpret that this has any kind of statute, um, that this has any kind of temporal restriction on it. Um, and so that really is the case law that defines. So, you know, if, if I want, if I ask the police department for, a, you know, calls for service um, for a year ago, two years ago, uh, you know, the statute defines that they have to do that. And it's the same thing for arrests. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, res there's obviously steps that would be reasonable you know, if I ask for everything that they did for five years, that's just kind of burdensome. And, and you know, they can, they can put limits on it based on that. But as far as, you know, if I ask for, if there was, um, like if I was looking for a particular arrest from five years ago, and that was important in my reporting, um, and the police department still had records on it, well, that's not something that they can deny me based on the letter of the statute. And, um, how courts have interpreted it. Okay, thank you. Um, related to some of that, uh, the privacy question, this is actually maybe a question for staff on, um, or I guess to, to either party, but I'm curious about the origin of this May 12th, 2020 email that is present in our materials now. Um, and if somebody can just tell me who, who is the origin of that? Why that's part of our materials? Sorry, May 12th email about um, for me. Yeah, it's set, it's set into the agenda materials. I think the city clerk can probably advise as to to which party advocated to include that. Yeah, so that was actually forwarded from um, Commissioner Shabazz today and uh, Vice Chair Shabazz. Sorry, I keep saying Commissioner. Um, and um, along with a couple of other documents that were already in the record. So. Um, that one was the only one attached. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll probably be making a motion later to, to heavily redact or, or remove that for um, various privacy reasons that we can talk about during discussion. Um, a question I have for um, special counsel, uh, Ms. Rogers. The, I'm curious what, it looks like in places we're talking about a 14 day look back period. And that seems to be the position that the city was taking initially. Now we're talking about a 30 day look back period. Um, could you walk us through the steps of whether the policy was changed 
whether it's continued to, and whether there's continuing evaluation of ongoing changes to it. Sure, um, thank you for the question. Um, and I might have to rely on Captain Emmett for some of these details because I understand that the 30 day policy um, went into effect when the department actually undertook to um, improve its uh, IT. Um, and it was a, a matter of um, practical possibility at that time to expand the uh, records. Now, I understand that if you go on the website, you can see these records for yourself in real time, um, up to 30 days back, uh, because there's, um, I think it's a CAT RM captain, perhaps I should leave this to you. I don't know what it is called, but it is now um, the practice and, and techno technological uh, capability of the department to have that 30 days. So I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, it, it does a little bit. I, I am also curious about, are we, are we at 30 days? So if somebody comes in with a request for 30 days, they're automatically going to get it. You know, what is the sort of the, the current practice as we look, did it essentially, did it change and, and, you know, in response to Mr. Morris's complaint at the time or so commissioner, I can uh, hopefully try to um, provide some more context to the conversation. Um, I can't tell you where the 14 day period came prior to May 12th. Um, everyone who was involved in uh, the executive decision-making process at that time has since retired. Um, I was promoted to uh, captain in July of 2020. Um, and since that time, the city has in the department has taken the position that we will provide 30 days. And most of that decision came from knowing that our computer aided dispatch and records management system that was being upgraded would be able to handle that um, in uh, Ms. Rogers uh, words in almost a, a real time basis. So the new system uh, went live on February 24th. We were able to go live with our, um, it's called Citizen RIMS. Um, we were able to go live with that function on uh, April 1st, but we have, dot, we have information going back to March 26th. Um, so as we build info, or as we uh, move forward, that database will continue to build information. There is a specific uh, tab on our Citizen RIMS page that is uh, dedicated to arrest. It is on a rolling 30 day calendar. So you will um, eventually when we get to 30 days, we're almost, we're, we're getting there. Um, you will have a, a, a 30 day look back of every arrest that the police department has made. Um, and it will just continue as the system grows. Now, after 30 days, those names that are uh, 31 or older will drop off of the system. Um, but we're hoping um, you know, to a couple of points made earlier with the, the time constraints that we can have with some of our uh, limited staff on hand, this CAD RMS system is hopefully going to allow us to point um, citizens in, in to one direction where they will have more information available to them. Thank you. Um, and I think that is uh... Oh yeah, my, my last question, um, this may be for you, Ms. Rogers. Um, you mentioned that you know, Alameda's policy is generally consistent with judicial guidance uh, and policies from sister jurisdictions. Could you uh, maybe just elaborate and let us know how the benchmarking occurred here and, and which, uh, which jurisdictions we are aligned with? Sure. Um, so I, I would like to first, I think, address some statements that Mr. Morris made about the import of the cruise and the interplay with that decision and the 2015 decision that I think could really help elucidate just exactly what the judicial landscape looks like on this um, front. Um, the uh, I think it's clear in our paper, um, our staff report explains that the Cruz decision in 1993 uh, rested on a statutory interpretation argument, um, supplemented with a purpose of this sort of review of the interplay of this uh, Public Records Act provision as it relates to you know, other protections for exactly the same information that are found in the penal code and other um, somewhat codependent, but 
it, it, you know, these different parts of the law interact, right? When it comes to arrest records. And so in some instances, there will be a very clearly articulated privacy interest. And in the Cruz case, you know, the rules of civil discovery were also barring some of the, um, the uh, accessibility of the requested records. Um, there was in 1985, a, um, an amendment to the statute that removed the requirement for current address um, from F1, which it relates to the arrest records and from F2, which relates to the request for assistance, but a ton, well, I shouldn't say a ton, I should be more specific. There are several provisions in F1 that still hearken to that contemporaneity requirement, such as where the individual is currently being held on what charges, these sorts of, you know, contemporaneity um, provisions that the Court of Appeal relied on to render its contemporaneity ruling in Cruz are still in the statute. Now, um, it, the Frederick's Court was also very careful to make sure it was saying our holding applies to the rule, uh, to the interpretation of subdivision F2 not subdivision F1, which there may be other, the court was very clear, there may be other policy concerns at issue with respect to F1. And that's what we're talking about here, right? With respect to those privacy interests for private individuals. It's not the person who calls the police to ask for, for assistance um, after you know there's an armed robbery. There was an armed robbery across the street from my house. That person calls and um, asks for assistance. And I wanna know that that happened, right? So there is more of a public interest in knowing about that. With respect to the private individual's arrest, if you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, you match the description of someone who's being described over the speaker, um, that, you know, that misfortune could then generate an arrest record that would be linked to your name. So there is a very different kind of privacy interest at play with respect to the records we're talking about here, right? Um, and I'll just pause there to make sure that I'm actually addressing something that, that you think is valuable to the decision you guys are trying to reach tonight. Um, is that helpful, Commissioner? I think that was a good sort of balance um, as we're talking about the legal landscape, and I'm sure that probably more will be fleshed out on that. Um, I am still curious also about the, um, the jurisdictional comparisons, if we can, with of respect course. to the length of the policy and look back. Yes, of course. So um, in the city's review of sister jurisdictions treatment of this policy, I'll just say San Leandro, Pleasanton, Berkeley, Milpitas, um, and San Diego all have 30 day uh, look back policies for these types of records. And that um, also the, the California League of Cities or League of California Cities, which is one of these organizations of um, municipalities throughout the state and they produce uh, really top notch legal guidance. Still, can, it, you know, even in 2017, as late as 2017, was citing to the Cruz case for the point of disclosability of arrest records sought under the California Public Records Act. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, we had Commissioner Bree, who's been patiently had her hand up, so I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you uh, to Mr. Morris and Ms. Rogers also for your for your presentations. Um, I have some some questions uh, for Mr. Morris um, I, that I, you know I would just like some uh, some clarification. Um, so the what data uh, was finally provided to you? Did you receive the full scope of um, of data that that you had requested? Yeah, more or less. After a lot of back and forth, I, I did get what I was looking for. Okay. And then is that is that data identical uh, to what is currently viewable on police logs? Uh, or did you receive the detailed information? Or I guess here. Uh, yeah. So is that is that data identical to what is currently viewable when there is an arrest or is the data that you received, did they have to add, add information because of your request? Uh, I'm not sure what's currently viewable. And to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure what I ended up um, getting off the top of my head. Like I, it wasn't a lot the, the the statute defines a lot of things like eye color and stuff that I I wasn't even that interested in and I, I don't really remember if the city gave it to me or not um I I just know that I was looking for kind of who was arrested um on what charges and then like the disposition whether they were booked whether they were released whether they're cited whether they're 
um, and, and and that that was all I really particularly cared about. So I, I the the kind of specific details of if everything that's included in the statute was included in that I don't recall. Okay, and then so it looks like uh, from the timeline, and please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Uh, so your initial request was April fifteenth. Um, and then uh, you received a response on April 27th. Is that, uh, does that sound sound correct? That sounds and, accurate. I, I, I don't have the specific dates in front of me. And then, um, but from my understanding, the, from the, uh, from the California Public Records Act uh, um, that Rashid also mentioned, uh, it's, it's 10 it's 10 calendar days where the city is is responsible to respond to a to a request maybe uh, the city attorney can respond to that it's is that 10 days because it looks like it was beyond the 10 days the initial response to mr morris if that's posed to me commissioner reed yes mm -hmm. yes um, there is a 10 day period, but it can be extended to 14. Um, and that is just, uh, again, to respond um, that we have documents or we don't have documents. And then the actual disclosure comes later. I see. And then, okay. and can I just add something there too? Um, potentially, it can go longer than 10 days if it falls on a Saturday or Sunday. It can bump to Monday as well. Okay. Just, so it's important to note the date of the week. Okay. And then, and then back to Mr. Morris. So then, uh, so then it, it appears that you received some documents on April 27th, um, but then there was a series of, of, of correspondence. Mm -hmm. And then Mr. Cohen uh, responded to you on April 29th. Um, and he, it looks like he concedes to, uh, to give you more information. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he states an additional 15 day delay. Um, so then you received additional documents uh, on May 12th. I don't know if that, if, so it was like a second batch on the, on the 12th. Okay. And then I was wondering uh, what, let's see. So then, and then there was another correspondence on the 15th where Mr. Cohen agreed to give you all of the data. So I think what I'm what I'm curious to know is why was the data given to you in sections like that in sort of the first section, the second section, and the third section? What is it that was that was missing? Um, it, it was it was more time. He he was giving me thirty days at a time, um, and and so he only because at first he was only agreed to, agree to give me thirty days, and he sent that. And, and then I said, no, you, by, the, by under the law, you have to give me more. Like he's, he cited this decision that's at issue. Um, and I said, no, that, that it just doesn't apply. Here's, here's some contradicting case law. And he said, okay, here's 30 more days. And I was looking for a total of 90. Um, specifically, actually what, what I was trying to do is, is look at the Alameda Police Department's whether or not uh, it had changed its booking practices in response to COVID-19 because there had been some guidance from the sheriff's office uh, not to book people into jail um, under um, particular circumstances. And I, and I wanted to know if the Alameda Police Department was following that guidance. And I want to know if others in the, in the county were following that guidance. So that th this is what I was after. Um, so 30 days wasn't helpful to me because that only covered only since COVID had really started, right? That was mid-March to mid-April. Um, so 30 days was useless. Um, so that's why I, I went back and argued 60 days was better. And then I got, but I, I still said, hey, under the law, as I understand it, you have to give me the full scope of my request, 90 days. Um, and it was only after I submitted this complaint, only after I filed the complaint and complained on Twitter about it, as they pointed out, uh, that, you know, I was then able to get this. So, and, you know, Going back to, to what Vice Chair Shabazz is um, at issue here is that I don't really see him as, as he wasn't a wink that this is a receptive audience. It was that like, this is a way for me to actually like get some accountability here because I was on Twitter and I had blasted the city of Alameda because I, I went and I, and I scored every agency that had responded to that request. 
and uh, and I scored Alameda really poorly. And as a person on this commission, he decided to you know say something to me and say this is a possibility, and I didn't know that. And I, and I only look at that as him actually just telling me that this option existed in the first place. So, um, you know, and it, and it was actually following this complaint as I see it, that actually got me the full scope of my request in the first place, which apparently wasn't, it didn't seem like it was gonna happen otherwise. It seemed like the city was digging in on that. Okay, thank you. And thank you for explaining that also. Um, and then, so then what happened after July? So it looks like there's a there's an email exchange between you and Mr. Cohen and um, it was after you had received um, your, uh, your request, um, but it's, I believe uh, there's something that mentioned, uh, that was mentioned that stated uh, that you would work together with Mr. Cohen on a retention disclosure policy. Um, did, was there some communication around that after July or basically what happened after July? And then um, I'm also wondering then, I mean, how did you find out that, that, that your complaint was classified um, uh, or withdrawn? Then uh, were you given an opportunity to revisit it or, or what, what happened there? No, um, and that's the thing is I had a phone conversation with Mr. Cohen and he asked me specifically to delay this complaint, not to withdraw it, but to delay it for 30 to 60 days as he indicated in his email. And for the reason that he said that he was um, surveying other agencies in the area and that he was going to come up with a policy that um, you know, was more in line with law. And, and look, I, I explained to him and I said, I, you know, I, I've consulted attorneys on this. I, I know a lot of public records lawyers um, and and I've, I've discussed this issue with them and they don't see any way that there's any reading of the statute that um, doesn't say that, you know, the full universe of arrests as retained by the police department is available. So I said that the, that the city's policy has to be to provide arrests within the reten period of retention. So if the police department, you know, wants to limit that, well, then they can set a retention policy that throws out these records and they don't have to retain the records of the people they arrested. But if they have those records, this law says that they have to release it. Um, so Mr. Cohen said that, you know, that was my position. I made that clear. Um, he said that he was, he was going to work on something that, you know, struck a balance um, and, and was going to talk to other area police departments and figure out the policy. And that's the last I ever heard from him on this. Um, and, and there was no follow up. There was no, he said it was, I was going to extend it for 30, 60 days. Um, and, and he was going to, he was going to come back with something after, after he's had a chance to work on it. He never came back. I never heard from him again. Um, and it was only after I saw this agenda, which I believe I saw that, um, vice chair Shabazz had, uh, tweeted. He, he may have, have uh, sent it to me. I think he asked me actually, if, if this was mine. And he said, look, here's, here's one that was closed on May 18th, is this you? And I said, yeah, but I didn't withdraw it. That was not why I, I agreed to suspend it for 30 to 60 days. And then I expected to hear from the city again, and I never did. I see, okay. Thank you so much. And then um, does the city, can the city clarify what happens in, uh, in situations like this where a complaint is put on hold uh, then what is the position of the of the city then? Are they responsible for reaching out to someone? Uh, does it automatically get uh, withdrawn? I, I'm I'm confused about what that process is from the from the city standpoint. I can answer that question, um, and I can I, l let me explain what happened. Mr. Morris and I had a discussion about establishing a records retention policy. As my email indicates, Mr. Morris informed me that he was represented by counsel. I told Mr. Morris, okay, you know, if you have an attorney out there who, uh, who can give me some idea of best practices, please have him co contact me. And his attorney never contacted me. And maybe there was a miscommunication here, but I felt under the state bar rules of ethical of ethical conduct, I am prohibited by law from contacting and having conversations with somebody who is represented by counsel. And so I was awaiting 
a phone call from Mr. Morris's attorney, and I never received one. Sir, that's that's not true. Um, I, I I said that I was not saying that I was represented by counsel. I my position was that I said that I had spoken to a lawyer who, you know, I asked some questions to sometimes. He wasn't representing me, and and, and this wasn't supposed to be an adversarial thing. And you asked him, you asked me to have him advise you on, on what best practices would be, uh, which is, wouldn't be inappropriate for if you thought that this was opposing counsel. And anyway, um, he didn't want to because he didn't think it was a good idea for him. So, I mean, I'm sorry I didn't like follow up with you about that, but to say that I, said that I was represented by counsel and you were prohibited from speaking to me about it, just isn't true. And frankly, you've been dishonest through a lot of this process. Hey, I don't see any more commissioners hands up. So I'm gonna go to Madam Clark and ask if we have any speakers. We do have one, Matt Reed. Hi, thank you. Uh, uh, clerk, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, I, I just two quick points. Number one, I think that as was just demonstrated in that back and forth, this complaint was handled very poorly by the city. Uh, if I understand correctly, it was classified as voluntarily withdrawn, and that's just erroneous and indefensible. So that alone, in my opinion, is a violation of how Freedom of Information Act requests or public act records at request should operate. That's the first point. The second point is the city, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, really uh, in, in the spirit of no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, if the city feels as strongly as suggested earlier that 30 days is an appropriate horizon for contemporaneity, then you just violated the privacy of individuals from days 31 to 90 by releasing those records at all. Uh, and I don't understand the city's position on that. Uh, I, I respect your, your belief that an individual is owed privacy, particularly in cases of expungement and when things were, uh, you know, in case of mistaken identity or what have you. Uh, but to sit there and, and preach about a 30 day policy and then release records for 30 day one to 90, I'm sorry, that just doesn't hold water. It sounds like the city doesn't have a policy. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm sort of really concerned here on two fronts. Uh, and I hope the commission really considers this, uh, you know, as, as far as what to do about it, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but clearly, uh, this did not go well in terms of how the city handled this request. Thank you. We, we have another speaker uh, now, Janice Anderson. Hi, good evening. Can you guys hear me? Um, I, I came into this meeting a little bit late, but I just find it really curious that the balancing test and redacting minors applies when it pertains to APD and their records, but not in regards to our neighbors interested in working on police reform. I'm also confused why um, Vice Chair Shabazz is being taken to task for merely communicating with a reporter when it was our own council member and former mayor who released the names of our neighbors on an angry racist next door post. Just finding a few things curious this evening. Thank you. And that was our last speaker. Okay, thank you speakers. Uh, thank you presenters. Um, okay, commissioners. Um, um, I think there's a whole bunch of things going on over here. It, it could be, you know, if we take it as being a black and white, as uh, Ms. Rogers said, there'd be one way to go. But I think being the open government commission, that uh, you know, we got to see more than black and white. And, you know, we have to see you know, the spirit of the law and, you know, how open um, our government is. That, that's my opinion. I'm not putting that all on you, but something that I have in my head right now, it's, uh, you know, the whole reason we have this open gov government commission is to be more public and more transparent about records. So it feels like there's some things that did not go smoothly here. And I, I sort of urge us to maybe put that in our discussion versus just going to a black and white, hey, well, he asked for 90 days worth of stuff and he got it and we just cut and close it and doing that. But maybe we should pry into, you know, how do we make it a better exchange for getting things handled? Because, you know, there's a little bit of bullying that was brought up 
and to have someone, you know, it just feels wrong. And I think all of us in a prior meeting, maybe not the last one, but I think when we had all, when we were looking at the public records that each, each of us commissioners pointed out and sort of asked the question of like, you know, what does this mean when someone voluntarily, you know, um, took their complaint off? So, and I think Mr. Cohen, you know, sort of asked him to do that. And I, I don't know if that's really the right way to go to say, hey, you have a complaint, but here, let me do some things on the side. And can you suspend your complaint? It, it just doesn't seem right. So I sort of just want to have that as like some of the points I'd like to tackle in this discussion. Um, but I'll open it up to other commissioners to maybe give us some talking points too. And hopefully we could get to a motion if there's not a motion yet. And maybe we could, uh, you know, sort of discuss all the different avenues because I see this as being a little bit more than black and white. Um, and I see a hand up from Vice Chair Shabazz. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm all about putting a little color in there too. Um, and I may try to use that analogy uh, today. Um, you know, first, I wanted to um, just building on what you shared. Um, I think there's something to say about the process that the complainant shared that they experienced. And so in particular, uh, I think in response to Commissioner Reed's uh, questions, you know, uh, I think he stated, you know, there was an initial request, eventually got some information. And I say eventually because it was 12 days and not 10 days, which is in violation of the California Public Records Act. Can I get a quick time out there? Um, Vice Chair Schwartz, hate to interrupt, but just because it's specifically at that point, because you had that question earlier, if it was calendar days versus business days, then we have Madam Clerk come in and say that, hey, if it falls on a Saturday or Sunday, then it carries forward. So then that's a little contradictory between business days and calendar days. Can we get a little color there before we go on, Vice Chair Shabazz? So we typically try and respond if it, we, we have a four day work week, city hall is only over four days. And so we typically try to respond, you know, um, by Thursday, if, if it falls over the weekend um, and that's our usual response, but um, it's just, I, I looked at the calendar quickly and if it was April 27th, that was a Monday. And I think that might've been the two extra days because of the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we were off, but, and it did fall within the 14 days at that point. So that was my only point. Okay. So it's not really a 10, so it's not really 10 calendar days. It's really 10 days you guys work and Friday's not a day you work. Yeah, right. But typically... Typically, we do respond within the ten, within the ten days because it's a within. But but I did happen to notice that that fell on a. Okay, I, Vice Chair Shabazz, the floor is back yeah. to you. I just wanted to get that in there because I think I as I think some other people were confused as well. Well, I think that's an important point, and I appreciate the uh, the I saw the timeout. Um, I I asked that question because my understanding from reading up on this is that it is uh, calendar days. The law does not state that it's business day. So regardless of the operations of the city, you know, and what typically happens, that did not happen in this case. So if we're going towards black and white, did the city violate, you know, did the city respond timely? Unless there's some other correspondence that shows there was a request for a 14 day extension, the city would be in violation of the Sunshine Act. Um, Sunshine Ordinance, excuse me, uh, in terms of not responding to the Public Records Act in a timely fashion. Um, so that's one point, and that can be a talking point for us to consider. I think to your point back again, um, using the color analogy, um, but really thinking about the process and how there was a request, there wasn't a response till the 27th, then there was a response with some legal, uh, a legal, legalistic response, uh, citing a statute, and then there was additional information that was shared, and then there was a complaint, and then what, there was additional information shared. And I think, you know, uh, I didn't hear Commissioner Reed ask this question, but I will ask it: Is like, why didn't, why wasn't the information just given in the initial request, opposed to, I think, uh, Mr. Moore's state obstruction? It was just not; it wasn't provided, and it wasn't provided timely. Um, I shared this before at a public uh, meeting, so I'll share this again. Um, in 
2018, I also filed a Public Records Act request for arrest information. Uh, and in, at this time, it was related to an incident at the Target store. Uh, I talked about this last month uh, at our meeting. And at that time, my Public Records Act request via C Click Fix was also denied. And it wasn't until I later requested information that I eventually got it. And so again, instead, of, and at that time, there was no reliance on privacy. There was a 14 day policy and opposed to just providing the information, there was uh, obstruction um, or there was, there was not this open spirit of uh, transparency. And so anyway, I think the piece around the relationship is really important, meaning that uh, if someone requests information the go-to should not be to not just provide the information. Um, the Public Records Act request I made in February, where I was able to receive the correspondence from Mr. Morris, it indicates on April 15th that our city clerk forwarded the information to the head of records at the uh, Alameda Police Department. And within like two or three hours responding to her indicated that she would be able to provide the information. However, the city attorney's office did not choose to provide that information. And so it did not seem, at least from the correspondence that's visible, that there is a technical uh, challenge to being able to act, ab uh, ab uh, what is it, extract or uh, access this information. So again, it seems to be that there is something blocking information coming out from our city attorney's office. And so I think there's something again in that relationship and that process that is the commission we should look into. So again, I think from a strictly black and white the uh, uh, I would uh, suggest uh, finding the complaint sustained on the basis of the lack of response within the 10 day period. And then as far as potential resolutions, I think there can be some um, uh, some conversation again about a potential pattern and potentially some way of reforming, um, providing consistent access uh, to records, uh, particularly coming from the city attorney's office. See Commissioner Reed's hand up. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to add, and thank you very much, Mr. Um, sorry, Vice Chair Shabazz, for your for your comments. I just wanted to add uh, that uh, I agree with um, the uh, with the goal of transparency and access to information. So uh, if a member of the public um, um, you know, comes to the city of Alameda, they request information, um, why isn't it provided uh, um, you know, upon the first request? So, and if the data is, is, is accessible, as we've seen in this situation where uh, on, there's a correspondence from May 12th, um, and uh, then there's a conversation that occurs. Uh, it, it sounds like it was a phone call. There's a reference to a, to a phone call on May 13th. And on that day, on the 13th, um, Mr. Morris received the remaining, inform um, the remaining information that he requested. So obviously that was fulfilled in one day. So if the information is accessible, uh, where um, Mr. Cohen is able to access the remaining information that he's looking for, which is, I'm, you know, presuming another 30 days in one day, then should this not be, uh, you know, available on day one? Thank you. Commissioner LaPlata. So um, this is a great discussion because I really, um, I'm wrestling with a lot of aspects of this complaint um, and am in, troubled by a lot of the same patterns that others are mentioning. Um, one out of the gate question I have with respect to timeliness, and I think it's still fair game to ask our chief assistant city attorney, um, just with respect to, you know, not advocating for the city, but in staffing our commission, um, if you could clarify under the law what the timeliness requirement is with respect to calendar days or business days. Cause my understanding is, I think that actually is rooted in, in the public records act itself. Yeah. My understanding is that the public record act does not specify calendar versus um, business and that general principles of law indicate that absent a, a um, um, denomination of either of those terms that you default to calendar days. So um in this case, my understanding is that it was made on a Wednesday, the 15th, and that 
the 10 day period would have been on a Saturday, the 25th. And so um, the 27th was the first business day. Okay, thanks. Um, I always like to stay rooted in the law where we, where we have yes. a legal premise. Um, I also, um, I do struggle with the, what, what I see is actually a compelling principle in, you know, sort of looking at these differences in types of information someone can request from a police department and seeing that there is a heightened privacy interest in my eyes. Um, and I don't know that this changes the way I'm gonna go here, but I do see a heightened privacy interest in arrest records relative to say calls for service. And I think that, you know, without delving into the case law, that sounds to me like a reasonable premise on which the case law may have developed to have a slight delineation between whether it makes sense to have a temporal limitation on arrest records because there is this countervailing privacy interest. And again, I'm not speaking as to what the case law says. I'm not an expert in that area. Um, but uh, from a common sense standpoint and also just a you know, societal concern standpoint, um, I, I find that to be a really important part of this. You know, How do we balance transparency and privacy interests? And um, I've said it before and I'll probably say it a million times here, but that's a really rough road, that intersection of those two ideas. Um, so with that, I, um, I wanna actually make a motion not related to the complaint itself, but just a very procedural motion um, to have our record for this agenda item um, heavily redact the May 12th, 2020 attachment to the email, which contains the arrest record log. Um, I was very troubled to see that come onto the website for the purpose of our hearing um, with respect to names and addresses. And so um, I, I, I think it I, I, would, I would sleep more peacefully as a commissioner if we have a mechanism for, while it makes sense from a transparency standpoint to have that in the record, to redact the information um, that I would consider private with respect to the individuals who are named on the attachment there. I would second that. And obviously staff, Chief Assistant City Attorney, please advise if that procedurally is not something we can do. Um, I would like to believe that there might be a mechanism to sort of correct that. If That is an appropriate motion. I mean, unless the city clerk has um, other ideas about the process, but from my standpoint, legally, that's fine. So we can do the redaction. Yeah. I saw a quick hand raised by Vice Chair Shabazz. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I appreciate the mo motion and I support the motion also. Um, my intention in forwarding the materials that I received was to share some of the dialogue that was happening that um, was not included in the exhibits that were shared from city staff. And so um, I, I support the motion and I can uh, re-forward um, some other specific documents because I think it is important to have the other material that was omitted by the uh, uh, that was omitted uh, that had also been in dialogue. So including the correspondence from 2021, as well as the other things that happened in between. And I support the motion. Okay, it looks like we had, well, I second it. Madam Clerk, can we do a vote on this? Commissioners at Chen. You're muted. <laughs> I, okay, that was an I. Uh, Lo Palato. I. Reed. Abstain. Shabazz. Aye. Telos. Aye. That carries four to one. Okay, the floor is still yours, Commissioner Lopalato. I think I'll pause there. I'm still kind of taking a lot in. There's, um, there's really a lot to consider here. I think this timeliness aspect uh, is an interesting angle uh, as we do look at the technicalities. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm unclear as to what our authority is in terms of recommending other types of resolutions, um, you know, regarding all these sort of meaty issues we're talking about with the relationship and the tendency towards obstruction and, you know, any of these things that we're perceiving as we absorb this complaint. Um, I, I, I don't know how much of that we can include in our decision here. Um, saving for item 3D, that's something I think we should think about in the way we look at uh, how we resolve matters generally. Um, but I am, I am curious about well, folks think on the, on the timeliness issue here, it does look like there is a potential angle there that wasn't really fleshed out that much. 
by Serge Boss. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was surprised with all that fancy legalese. Nobody did the mathematics of uh, 27 minus 15. Um, so I wanted to speak to your comment, Commissioner Lopalato, regarding um, privacy and balancing. And actually, I wanted to um, say I do think that's a really important principle that I think um, should be in the conversation of a policy. And that was something that was promised by a staff member to do for or maybe in partnership with a community member and they never followed up. So I think back to the relationship piece, there was, you know, some unfulfilled promise there. Um, what I actually wanted to, uh, what I, I wanted to speak to regarding the privacy, um, again, when I mentioned my own request for information from uh, August 20, uh, 2017, you know, the reason why I requested an information was because there was this incident where apparently, um, according to some video on social media, which I later got access to, uh, there were weapons drawn on some young people, uh, young black folks at the Target store over here on the West End. And there was a very long message posted to Alameda Police's, um, the Alameda Police Department's social media account, uh, sort of explaining that uh, and stating that this person had, you know, apparently had a stolen car or something like that. Um, so I requested this arrest information to be able to verify that and got stonewalled. Eventually, I was able to get that information. I was able to go to the district attorney's office to find out that um, I don't know if there was a stolen car or not. But nonetheless, that's not what they were charged for. And so the apparatus of the social media account was used to, you know, put out a certain narrative. And by being able to access information, I'm able, you know, I mean, once I finally published this story, I'm able to nuance that in a certain way. And so I think um, I appreciate the, the concerns about privacy rights. And I think there's also something to be said about the public interest in journalists um, being able to access information and tell stories. So um, anyway, I just wanted to share that point. And then again, um, back to the, you know, thinking about all these different aspects of this particular case, there's the initial responses to public records, there's this uh, uh, promise of some policy, there's where, where is the city of Alameda benchmarked in relationship to other agencies, right? And how many agencies, is it just three? Or are we going to do a wider spectrum? And, you know, do we want to be at the this end of the spectrum of, uh, you know, shrouded secrecy? That's just uh, illustration, not stating that that's what it fully is. But are we going to be on air on the side of transparency or um, what I think the perception may be? Um, and then I think there's also something to be said about, you know, uh, updating. So this is going into some of the resolutions. I think there's something to be said around I think specifically the city attorney's office with the uh, Public Records Act um, request. So, um, you know, I shared a few months ago some materials in which, and at my uh, presentation on the Public Records Act, I was able to visualize some of the sources of Public Records Act. And the city attorney's office is the area where um, I actually didn't get that until this year. So whereas other departments were uh, not necessarily forthcoming, but they provided this information around Public Records Act, um, the city attorney's office is the one that I didn't get until much later. And so it seems to be some challenges there. And perhaps it is because there's different types of legal questions that may be involved. I don't know. But um, I think one of the potential resolutions is we have an annual report now in which there's, um, you know, we've broken down what the Public Records Act um, what's actually happening, perhaps there could be um, one of the duties of the commission is uh, uh, evaluating, you know, the performance. And so perhaps an performance evaluation could be done. Whereas like, you know, the city clerk has shared that is a measure of uh, their job or her job is a performance evaluation metric or I, I can't explain that precisely. You can, I see you laughing with the mask, so I must be close. But perhaps something of that nature could be done with the city uh, attorney's office. And, um, you know, if there, there is a sustained complaint and, you know, y'all want to do a penalty, maybe somebody can go to a uh, Public Records Act um, training. Okay. Just uh, from listening to all the commissioners and sort of getting the vibe of this, I think um, I'm trying to put it in the most uh, um, in terms of all encompassing that maybe we all think that something happened here and that this is definitely unfounded. Uh, so my question to the city clerk on this is, you know, what are our options for next steps? And let me just um, show you where my head is going. If we found this to be sustained, 
usually we would come up with resolutions and we'd say why it's sustained and we do all that. And I could see that taking quite a bit of time. And I know we do have another complaint here too. Is this possibility that, you know, there's a motion that's sustained then at a later time we take, you know, we figure it out what the resolutions are to say, hey, city's attorney's office should be doing this. This is, should be going this way. Is that, you know, can we do that? Or are we hear, hey, we, we're gonna vote on this. We're gonna sustain it or not sustain it or, or it's unfounded. And we have to give all the reasons why and do the write up now. Is where, where, what do we have to do here? So I, I think for our purposes, we, we have to get the written decision done within 30 days. That's required in the code. And so, um, you know, the clearer uh, direction you could provide for to go into the written decision that will then be circulated for all of you to sign, um, the better, because then uh, your next meeting isn't until, uh, you know, May. And so that would be past the 30 days. Got it. I saw Commissioner Reed's hand go up. And just my last comment, I just wanted to also clarify. Um, so from uh, from my point of view, I, um, uh, I understand that if the city retains records, uh, then should they not be available to the public? I mean, you know, should they or should they not be available to the public? So um, that's kind of where I'm landing here is, I mean, if the policy of the city of, of Alameda is to retain the records, um, then, you know, should they be available to the public? Um, and I also wanted to ask Chair Telos, did you mean, um, uh, sorry, at the beginning of your, of your conversation, uh, that, so that we're leaning more towards sustained is this no, I said, you know, that something is wrong. I didn't say, we, oh, okay. maybe I said that, but my thing was that something is not right here. We may sustain, we may find it unfounded, we may find it, you know, with merit, but I think there's something here that, and I was trying to get us towards a vote on that, but I don't think we have all the answers yet as far as like resolutions and why we would go this route or that. And, you know, my thing was more of this, you know, um, we do have another complaint um, that we do have to address. And I think we have some commissioner um, conversations to have as well. So I was trying to get us to see if that was even an option, but it doesn't look like that is an option. Commissioner Chen. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that the, we, sit, we saw something wrong, which was, the fact that a, a citizen requesting public information was was jacked around, <laughs> you know, was pushed around, and uh, until he made the threat or the actual complaint, he did not get the data he was re requesting. So, is that how the city of Alameda wants to treat public records requests? So that's an important issue, but it wasn't on our agenda. So basically we need to agendize it for another meeting because then we would be in violation of the Sunshine Ordinance because here we would be trying to act on something that we didn't uh, pre-warn the public on that we were gonna do. So, you know, the, um, the complainant did admit that he did not think he had a, uh, his complaint was, he had a valid Sunshine Ordinance complaint at this point. Um, so he, he was just utilizing this as, as a forum to be able to speak with us and the community at large about the difficulty he had in obtaining public records. So I think we do need to vote on whether or not the Sunshine Ordinance is violated according to his complaint. And then I, I would really love it if we would pick up this issue at a subsequent meeting. I see your hand up, Vice Chair Shabazz, but I want to make this point first. You know, we've, you've asked the Vice Chair Shabazz and I've asked the question and Commissioner Lopalado asked the question. And I think, you know, on timeliness, <laughs> he was violated. I think that 
could be a black that could be just a black and white one right there so we did have to put in some reasoning behind why we would sustain something i, I think you know simple math gets us there and even the chief assistant city attorney has concluded that it's like hey when it's not state if it's business state or calendar days you have to default to um calendar days and you know i appreciate um madam city clerk telling us that you know they don't work on fridays so maybe that you know was part of it right there and something fell on a saturday but at the end of the day 10 days didn't happen so i think just for that reason alone we would be able to sustain this complaint um then as commissioner chen said it's like yes maybe we'll put this on the agenda and then let's talk through like what should be um the process as commissioner vice chair shabazz said is you know how do we want citizens and journalists to feel when they're asking for records um yeah so that's sort of where i'm leaning towards there um vice chair shabazz Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was just going to say in response to uh, Commissioner Chen's comment. Yeah, I disagree with Mr. Morris. I think there was a I, there was a violation of the Sunshine Ordinance based on the uh, lack of a timely response. Um, I am prepared to make a motion to that effect, and I do want to note. Um, I want to respond to your uh, comment about the potential resolution and whether we have to go to another meeting or our future meeting or whatever. Um, so when I uh, had a uh, my 2019 Sunshine Ordinance complaint, um, there was a subsequent meeting at which the, uh, I don't know the process because I was recused as the complainant, but there was a subsequent process of how the actual decision was written. And so um, I'm hoping maybe stat, uh, I see you kind of nod and maybe you can clarify that as a potential option. And then again, based on some of these things that folks are identifying, as far as the actual process and not to valid, invalidate Mr. Morris's uh, feelings. I'm not necessarily concerned about his feelings. I don't want people to feel bad, but I'm not necessarily concerned about his feelings in this sense, as I am concerned with the behavior of city staff in their response uh, to this information. And the fact someone had to you know, cite legal code, make a complaint, that was my experience that led to my own complaint. It was not until I filed a complaint that I received a response of no response. And that should not be what people have to do when simply uh, attempting to, you know, request things underneath the California Public's Record Act. Okay, I don't, I don't see any other hands up. So if we were ready to make a motion uh, by, oh, I see a hand up, Commissioner LaPlata. All right, just before we get into any motions here, um, I am, curious as to the scope of just in terms of resolution options i think we're pretty limited in terms of what we can actually recommend um and i i'm wondering if we're if we're going to limit our motion to simply whether we're going to sustain the complaint or not um you know how we want to bifurcate that and i think it might be a good idea to decide on the front end um and then i'll I'm continuing to wrestle, so I'll just leave yeah, it. Uh, to respond to that, I would think um, a resolution to sustain based on timeliness, I would approve of that right there. Um, as far as like, you know, talking about the process and all that, I think that could come at another meeting. But as far as like, you know, what needs to be done and follow this complaint, you know, I would, I think that's where I'm leaning towards. Um, I see Chief Assistant City Attorney with the hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Tilos. I did want to add a little bit of, of context um, because I um, my role here is not as an advocate for either side. It's to provide advice as to law that you all are um, you know, grappling with in this very robust discussion. Um, and to that discussion, I want to add the fact that um, there this what I'm going to say applies to to um, the world of court. So I take that with the grain of salt, but there is a code provision in the Code of Civil Procedure that is accepted um, for all courts in California that when the last day to perform or complete any act um, falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or holiday, the time, limit is, time limit, limit is extended until the next court day closer to the trial date. And I, I raise this just because I, I want to make clear that 
when I was asked by, I believe it was Commissioner Lo Pilato about the uh, business day, calendar day, I stand by what I said that there is no um, uh, references I'm aware of in the Public Record Act, and so the default is it's a calendar day. However, in um, the world of um, um, filing um, documents in court, there are also similar statutes that provide that various response dates are um, calendar days. But if you end up having your calendar day fall on a holiday or Saturday or Sunday, that does not mean that you need to go down to the courthouse and try to uh, vainly file your document on that day. It is. It always does then. Um, it sort of becomes a, a um, business day um, exception, if you will, because then it, it, it does allow you to then um, file your document on the following Monday or next business day. So I do wanna add that context. It's something for you to consider, I, I, but I did wanna round out the discussion on the, that because it sounds like that's gonna be something that you all are going to be um, contemplating in making a decision. Yeah, I take it um, if it's Saturday or Sunday, holiday or a Friday where the city does some work that can include it as well, correct? Well, the, co the, uh, the code of civil procedure doesn't note, uh, it says it's it literally, I, I can give you the citation if, if you'd like, it's- uh, I, I, uh, okay, I, okay. I think we're okay with that. Okay, <laughs> but I, I just I, want to make that point. I, I under, under, we're, understand. We're following a lot of loopholes here. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Lopalato. Yeah, just, just really quick. Um, I really appreciate that, um, Chief Assistant City Attorney. I think that is is part of the difficulty when we get into such a, a tight technicality here. Um, and I'm also wrestling with the fact that it that it was not offered up by the complainant, um, and yet is a way to identify a, you know, there's sort of a hook here to something that went wrong. Um, however, I did want to add as we're talking about timeliness and deadlines. Um, the perspective that from in civil litigation, there's a similar issue that occurs where um, parties are asked to engage in discovery and exchange in document production. And so it's a little bit similar in that there's, you know, a 30 day timeline for that. And uh, the deadline, you know, it falls on a certain day and it's a little bit more applicable, I think, than like a court filing day being closed. And I'm wondering if the chief assistant city attorney could speak to sorry to be putting you on the spot here, um, what the practice is when that happens. I know my personal practice is usually to produce things early to avoid any ambiguity as to when the deadline was. Um, but I'm curious if you are aware of sort of an uh, analogous production deadline that might, that might guide us. Yes, well, I can say that, that um, it, it um, generally speaking, it, it would, you would, you would still get the benefit of the holiday that um, I think most attorneys like you being um, paranoid, um, not to say you're paranoid, but would, would ensure that, that documents are postmarked or emailed, um, even if it's going to, you know, if that means you have to do it a day early. But um, my understanding and, and um, is that if, if your 30 days to, to respond to discovery happens to fall on New Year's Day, you, and a, a national holiday, that you get the benefit of that, that you don't have to actually disclose your documents until the second. I would be hard pressed to think of any situation that I personally have dealt with where somebody has gone to the mat trying to say that the person in, that, in my example um, was late because they produ didn't produce things on on January 1st. So I think it's, it's a, it's, it's, yeah. Boss, there's your boss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you for that explanation and thinking about, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> a reminder to myself as I try to say something intelligent. Uh, the idea, as I understand it, the uh, idea of the spirit of the law, right, versus the letter of the law. And um, I think that's what I'm hearing, part of what I'm hearing about this whole 10 day thing. Uh, and, you know, again, I also find it interesting that, you know, in the response to the complainant, there was the quick going to the letter of the law. Um, but I hear folks here wanting to be a little mer more merciful 
um, and not necessarily not necessarily uh, be as uh, lettered up. Um, so I wanted to um, share uh, not necessarily a concern, but uh, something from a previous uh, complaint. And so the decision that happened in uh, July 2019 uh, from this commission in regards to my own complaint, similar related to the Public Records Act, uh, I actually want to read something for this and, and why I think this is, um, I'll share why I think it's relevant. Um, so as part of the uh, complaint, uh, it says, you know, the principal remedy is to cure uh, is in order to cure or correct. For violations of this nature, the Open Government Commission may also issue a fine, but only for subsequent similar violations. And then it references the Municipal Code 2-93.8 penalties. Then it states, as there is no evidence in the record of an existence of a similar, a subsequent similar violation, and a responsive email has already been produced to the complainant, the evidence may support finding a finding of a technical violation without further remedy. Well, I think in this is incident, this is evidence of a previous or a previous uh, violation. And so I think um, my own opinion is uh, going with the letter of the law of the 10 days, which um, wasn't referenced by the um, legal analysis. Uh, and then coming back to figure out what is that um, potential um, penalty or not if necessarily penalty, but what's the recommendation? Like, is that a, a, a finally having that process that the complainant was, uh, uh, was, uh, was promised? Um, or maybe that's been created, I don't know. Um, but I, I, again, I think, you know, in this instance, I'm, I'm more, uh, going towards the letter because of the pattern that I've observed. Mr. Reed. And thank you so much, um, Vice Chair Shabazz, uh, for that additional background uh, on, um, on your case from, from 2019. Um, if it's okay, I, I think I'm ready um, to make a motion. And um, uh, so I would like to propose um, a motion to sustain um, the complaint based on um, the uh, on um, the uh, the fact that the that Mr. Morris uh, did not receive the totality of his request within um, the the 10 days that is uh, that is that is supposed to be provided to him um, through the uh, through the provisions of the California Public Records Act. I, I'm take time. I so that's um, a please, please. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's the most. I have a question to that, and may, just a clerical one that the ten days refers to response, right? Not provision or getting all the paperwork to them. So I think that's just you know a false motion to start off with. Okay. So maybe I should just clarify that then. So the motion is to sustain um, the complaint uh, based on um, the uh, the on the lack of receiving his um, a, uh, a response within the required 10 day um, uh, allotment um, through the California Records Act request. I see a hand up by Chief Assistant City Attorney. Yes, I did want to clarify uh, my previous answer. I was able to locate belatedly an answer to uh, Commissioner Lopolato's question that um, there is actually a provision in the California Discovery Act that if the last day to perform or complete any act in discovery falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or holiday, the time li limit is extended until the next court day closer to the trial date. So I did want to just note that. Second. Commissioner Chen. Um, thank you. Um, somehow I feel like we, we, we want to punish the wrongdoing by acting on this motion, which really doesn't get to the heart of the problem. And to get to the heart of the problem, we have to 
do, I think we have to go another route and we need to separate whether or not um, the Sunshine Ordinance was violated as per the complainant's complaint. I know I, this sounds very strange, but I, I, we, we want to punish somebody for something, right? And we want to thank Mr. Morris for bringing this to our attention. But those things are, in, in my mind, because I've been sitting through court, <laughs> are separate from whether or not we should sustain this, the, his complaint on the Sunshine Ordinance. Because we're bending over backwards to count 10 days, right? 10, you know, and, <laughs> and somehow it feels kind of like uh, we're, tr we're, we're trying to do one thing using a mechanism that won't allow us to do that one thing. So we have to do that things at a later date. Yeah, I, um, I, I agree. I, I, well, I, I get what you're coming from. It's like, we're, we know something's wrong, but we're basing our whole motion on a technicality when I think we really need to dig deeper of, into what really was being wrong and how do we form that in the motion in the amount of time we have. That's why I was really trying to delay things where until we, we do have another solid hour, hour and a half to really get to the core of it. Um, Madam Clerk, I know you said that um, once oh. we do make a decision that we have 30 days to do the write-up. Yeah, L last time um, the commission actually um, continued the decision to a hearing and uh, to, uh, to, 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 you continued the matter and then you didn't have a quorum is what happened and that's why it ended up at a subsequent agenda. So um, basically that was done once before where the commission, you know, continued this item to, you know, a later date, like next Monday, for example, you could continue this item specifically to that date and then make formulate the decision at that day. And then, um, you know, you can move on to your other agenda items. Um, but hopefully there would be a quorum and all, everyone would attend and we wouldn't run into the problem that we ran into the last time we did that. So could, could this possibly continue to the next meeting or would have to be like the next Monday? The, the timeline is 30 days, so. Oh, 30 um, days from right now. Yeah, to, to formulate the decision. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, Commissioner Reed. Okay, so so um, if I could just make this a little bit uh, more simple. So I am willing to withdraw my uh, motion to create a new motion. And the new motion would be just to sustain the complaint without anything behind it. So I, I would like to make a motion to sustain the complaint. Commissioner Shabazz. Um, just as a point of order, uh, there's a motion in the second on the floor. So I don't even wanna get confused by all the parliamentary procedural stuff, but I, I, I guess what I would suggest is in the context of discussion, this motion, I'd be interested in hearing what other folks think about that. Cause I hear what uh, commissioner Chan just said, and I, I understand the, or I think I have some understanding of maybe what the intention is behind attempting to withdraw the motion to put a new one forward. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I believe we've done that one in the past where there was a motion out there and we started talking and the original motion maker withdrew it. So I think we're within procedure or maybe not um, the specific, I forget the name of the guy who made those rules for the parliamentary procedure, but I don't think we're out of bounds um, based on precedent that we have before. Commissioner Lopalato. In the um, interest of moving things along and, and transparency, uh, I will say I am uh, I'm finding myself aligned with Commissioner Chen's comments. Um, and and still also very troubled by what we heard today. If that helps move things forward. 
I think maybe kind of everybody putting their cards on the table can get things rolling. Yeah, I'm not sure if that really makes things uh, easier. I think it complicates things more because we were, the, the easy route was just say, hey, timeliness, sustain. But I think it doesn't make it easier, but I think it makes it more right. Which uh, I think uh, we, we, we need to dig deeper than um, crafting up um, what we're gonna do. Um, Vice Chair Shabazz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think that's the spirit and not the letter. Um, I appreciate the uh, the uh, that perspective of you know I'm not I'm not trying to punish nobody. I am uh, sitting as someone who's concerned with um, making sure the uh, the Sunshine Ordinance is is uh, that we as a commissioner that it's being applied. Um, if my concern with uh, potentially the withdrawal around this, and I don't necessarily think it's a technicality, but I get the point, like, right? Like the complainant didn't specifically name this. The uh, fancy legal counsel didn't specifically address this. Um, if this um, issue is not what is um, sustained or addressed uh, and then yeah, I don't know what the, uh, not necessarily the mechanism, but like, what is that process, right? And, I, and it makes me think of something else that Commissioner Lopalato said a few months ago uh, regarding our uh, null and void, uh, I don't know what y'all call that, tobacco process, like, because it wasn't, uh, it's, it was confrontational, I think was the phrase that you used. Um, it wasn't collaborative. Um, so it's making me think about, all right, how do you address this? Like, again, uh, not coming from a position of, yes, yeah, someone needs to be punished, but you know, what is the, when there's a pattern, um, or at least more than one instance of this happening, um, uh, what is the mechanism to change the behavior? And so, you know, um, I didn't want to make a mama reference, but I'll make a parenting reference, you know, opposed to, I'm not into the, uh, physical, uh, discipline, um, but like, what's the, what is it, the, uh, not authoritative, like, so like thinking about uh, motivational psychology, right? Like, what is the motive? Like, I'm not trying to beat on the uh, city attorney's office, right? But what is the, what do we need to take away? Or what do we need to say, like, you know, not trying to put y'all on time out, right? I'm sorry if the, I'm using these analogies, uh, not trying to belittle y'all. And I don't think we should be little children either, but I'm trying to use these analogies to, uh, to get to, you know, what I think, you know, uh, Commissioner Chen said the heart of it is. So like, what is the method in which we can change this behavior to address um, if it was harm or like the, the poor process that's currently in place and how can we make a better process? Um, but again, at the core of it, I still think there was a violation even if it wasn't explicit, as explicitly stated um, by the complainant or the uh, presentation. Mr. Reed. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, uh, so I have a couple of questions here. So just to be clear, is my motion on the floor or not? Uh, your mo your latest motion to sustain Same. was made and I, we didn't get a second and we started discussing it. Okay, so, um, so if it's okay, can I amend my motion at this time? Would that be, and I guess it'd be an amendment because it was pretty, it was very basic. I think the usual procedure would be to withdraw and say something else. But since your motion was only to sustain, I would think that's okay. Okay, so if I could just amend it um, for clarity. Um, so, you know, looking at those dates, um, you know, it is, uh, you know, it, it does fall um, under um, 14 days, which, technically it would be, um, it would fall under a violation uh, in, my, in my opinion. Um, I also uh, would like to point out the importance that the um, requester did not receive um, the totality of the information that he requested. And that, and the fact that he had to go back and forth and that took, um, 
uh, an extended period of time, um, which as we, I think that we collaboratively agree uh, is, is, uh, is not the trans, it's, is not the uh, procedure that falls within the, uh, the spirit of the Brown Act and the transparency that we are seeking as open government commissioners. So, um, you know, uh, so when a, you know, an individual makes a request to the city, um, they should be able to uh, you know, fulfill that request in its totality, unless there's some question um, about uh, what that person is, is requesting, which is not the case in this situation, um, then it should fall within that, um, that time period. And so clearly this, is, this does fall outside of it and he did not receive the totality of it. So, um, so I would like to, to amend my motion um, to sustain the complaint based on um, the, uh, on the uh, lack of timeliness. Thank you. Um, I like where you're going with that. Let me try to rephrase it and look something more succinct, but going down those lines and see if this will work for everyone. Lack of totality of request in an efficient manner. I, I think, think that, that sort of yes. captures it because he didn't get everything, you know, when he should have. We don't bring up the days. We don't bring up, but because my, I think what Commissioner Chen, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like, you know, the spirit of it wasn't really followed. He got all his stuff, everything. He agreed to that. We agreed to that. But he had to make some complaints to do it, and he had to go back and forth. So that clearly wasn't efficient to get that information. So I think I sort of capture the spirit in that by saying being sustained for lack of totality of the request in an efficient manner. And you know, feel free, our lawyers on here, Commissioner Laplau, if you want to clean that up. But I think I'm going down the lines that Commissioner Reed was going in that path. I think I sort of capture the spirit of what Commissioner Chen didn't want us to get hung up by this 10 days or 14 days. And uh, I, I think we're getting closer. Um, Commissioner Shabazz, I saw your hand up and I saw Commissioner Lopalato. I think we're sort of getting there. So thank you, Commissioner Reed, for like restating that. It took a couple of times and yes. hopefully thank my you. restating it could help us get a little closer as well. So thank you. Yeah. So then I would like to officially amend my motion to include um, what you stated, uh, which would be um, that it did not follow the spirit of the Brown Act, and it did not fall within um, that the that the that the uh, requester did not receive the totality of, of the information um, within um, the required in, time. in an efficient manner. I just in an efficient manner exactly. Thank you. Commissioner Shabazz, oh, yeah, Commissioner Shabazz, and we'll go La Plato and Chen. Uh, yeah, I have a different uh, comment. So if you want to cycle back to other folks, um, but just as a point of information, um, I don't think the references to the Brown Act, and again, the, uh, the Public Records Act does not prescribe a specific time in which records have to be produced. Again, that 10 days is related to a response. Yeah, that's why I just said efficient. I think that sort of covers it because it wasn't efficient for Mr. Morris to have to go back and forth with the city. Uh, Commissioner Lopalato? Yeah, I was actually just gonna, I see our chief assistant city attorney with a hand raised um, and I was, I was going to suggest that we obtain some legal guidance on these terms like totality and efficiency that I'm not aware are rooted in law, perhaps they are, but um, if we are going to move forward with anything like this, let's, if we can, um, if there is, statutory guidance for it let's use the right words um so maybe yeah we'll get chief um, assistant city attorney can help yeah let's get commissioner chen's comments in then we'll go to chief assistant city attorney okay since since i had to read this when i first joined <laughs> it's uh from the uh, city of alameda board and commission's guide open government commission um it lists what we're supposed to be doing and one of them is reporting to the city council at least once annually on any practical or policy problems encountered in the administration of the Sunshine Ordinance. So this is definitely 
a practical and policy problem encountered in trying to um, act upon the Sunshine Ordinance. So I know it's funky, but I, I feel like <laughs> we should, it, his complaint is not sustained, but to really double down on saying this, his complaint highlighted and brought into a spotlight this really serious problem that he is not the only one who has faced. So that belongs in the Sunshine Ordinance and in fixing the Sunshine Ordinance. And we are, we are, we are tasked with telling the city council where we see problems emerge in the Sunshine Ordinance. So it's a, it's a harder climb, but it's actually cleaner because I, I keep feeling like a pretzel in trying to, <laughs> trying to sustain his complaint. That's just me. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. I think, I think, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I think that's something we could agendize or put it under, you know, commissioner comments for another meeting as well to, you know, what we're presenting to council. Um, and thanks for your view on ex of why you would not sustain or sustain. Um, but we'll leave that up to your vote. And if when we do get to a vote of how you go about that, um, Chief Assistant City Attorney. Sure, I just wanted to to um, echo um, uh, Vice Chair Shabazz. And as an aside, I realized throughout this meeting, I've been saying Commissioner Shabazz and not Vice Chair. So my apologies, I, I didn't mean to do that. Um, but to, to Vice Chair This is Shabazz a point of information. I don't really care for Vice. Okay. So if you call me Commissioner, Brother Rashi, I understand the, you know, the quorum and no harm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so just to clarify a couple of points um, that I think they've already been made is um, are that the Sunshine Ordinance does require um, a response from the city within 10 days, um, just as whether or not um, there are responsive documents. And then if, um, if more time is needed to make that determination, then a notice can be sent out to the um, requesting party um, indicating an additional 14 days. I think earlier I may have um, not made that clear. It's not 10 or 14, it's 10, then an additional 14 days. Um, at that point, uh, once the um, requester has received um, a notification from the city within either of those timeframes about whether or not the documents are this and can be produced, the, the period of producing the documents is, there is no set deadline. There, um, there is a lot of case law about um, the process by which a, a um, in this case, city needs to, to follow um, and the efforts it needs to make, um, but there's, not, there's no specific time frame. There's no specific um, um, uh, parameters that, that um, spell out exactly what the city has to do that, that's objective. And I, um, I'm, so that's one thing to consider as far as um, the terms, and I think I have them, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chair Tilos, but I think the two, doc, uh, two terms that were being um, discussed were um, totality and efficient or efficiency, is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, lack of totality of requests in an efficient manner. Okay, um, um, I'm not aware of either of those terms being used in the Sunshine Ordinance. Um, I don't know if either, either of those terms are used within case law that interprets either the Brown Act or in this case, the Public Records Act. Um, I would imagine that one or, or both of those terms is used at some point in case law in some context, but so I'm not gonna say it's not used. I have uh, the, um, because those are both pretty common terms used in general in law, but it is not to my knowledge, some, a standard that's, that's um, used in the Sunshine Ordinance in front of you tonight. Did I answer the questions that came up, just the legal questions that had come up? Is it okay if I, if I say something, Chair Tilos? 
Yeah, Commissioner Reed. Okay, thanks. So, um, so just to be clear here that the documents were available. It's not as if the documents were unavailable and the requester on, if I'm doing the math correctly, on April 15th, we, he made the initial request 12 days later. So we can, you know, we can argue about that this way or, or that way, but he did not receive all of the information that he requested. So um, by uh, the, the response date, which was that 27th. So he received only 14 days of data on April 27th. Then he had to go back and insist that they give him more information. And it's not as if the data did not exist, it's that they were reluctant to give it to him. And then he did not receive uh, the, the next, I'd say, uh, you know, cache of information um, until the 12th, where he also only received 16 days of data. So that's only, so that's a total of 30 days of data, which is not what he had requested until he finally had to push for that information. Okay. And when he finally pushed for it, they responded and they gave it to him in one day. Okay. So, and that was the full 87 days of data. So that's why I, I strongly feel that uh, this complaint is sustained, that the city should provide the data available. Uh, the city retains the data under the California Records Act request. Um, they must be available to the public. And when a member of the public reach, um, when he receives this, this type of, uh, of, uh, of resistance or obstacle, uh, it is our duty here, uh, the, uh, you know, as the Open Government Commission to ensure that, that there is transparency and that, you know, members of the public should be able to, you know, confidently request this, you know, information from the city and the city should be able to, to provide it with full transparency. So this is why I would, my, so that my motion is to sustain, to sustain it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to say a few things and I, I want to try not to take too much more time because I've said a lot this evening, y'all. So thank y'all for bearing with me. Um, I guess first, um, just in response, um, thank you, Commissioner Reed, for sharing um, your rationale um, and your concerns with the, uh, the process and uh, issues around transparency. Um, one of the things that I understand about the uh, or as I understand some of the intention of the California Public Records Act is uh, what the uh, special counsel um, stated around a balancing act, right? So this idea of there's transparency, but also you have to weigh it against um, the privacy of private citizens, which in this society, there's some primacy around privacy. Uh, and then there's also another aspect in that balancing related to the efficient sort of operations of the state, right? So, you know, if somebody is just doing hella public records act requests or a lot of public records act requests for those unfamiliar with that colloquial expression, um, if they're doing a lot of, you know, requests to try to slow down the operations of, you know, the, the uh, government, like it makes it um, ineffective, right? So uh, I just wanted to address like the, I hear around the full, transparency and then also just emphasizing the points that have been brought up before around privacy. Um, I think the issue around the 10 days for me is clear. It's not really twisted. It's, you know, if a member of the public makes a request, according to the California Public Records Act, as you know, I guess 19 whatever, and then in the constitution, you know, you have uh, the state constitution that is, you, there's 10 days to respond. So that is, we have these records, we're just looking for them right now. Or that is, we don't have this, but you can go to Alameda County and request those because that's who has it. Or it's, we're actually not sure what you're looking for. Could you clarify, right? There's all of these responses that um, are supposed to happen. So it's not the production of the full amount of data within 
you know, the 10 days or 14 days, 10 days to respond to a request. And then they can request an additional 14 day extension. Uh, and it is those extensions, <laughs> as it was mentioned earlier by the complainant, why the city of Oakland just got sued and the Georgia judge ordered all of these records to be released. Um, so I'm clear on the 10 days. I understand the concerns around like it seeing like it's some technicality to exact some punishment. Uh, and I just, I think an op, an, a different way of uh, sort of approaching it is, uh, and I think this is what uh, Commissioner Chen was speaking to is a concept of, called a restorative justice. And so thinking how could that be applied here? So yes, there is this violation and then there's also something else where the complaint may have felt violated, right, by their treatment, uh, the way their uh, complaint was portrayed to us. Um, and it's the fact that it was portrayed to us as if it was suspended, but the correspondence indicates that maybe a week before our meeting, they said, no, nah, they didn't suspend it and they you be being dishonest. So, so I think um, beyond that, there's certain things that could be done. So one is to, to Commissioner Chen's uh, comment, something we can come back to or provide some direction on is, you know, updating the city council. Like these are concerns that have come up with providing access to public records. Um, two is the uh, getting the updated policy that Mr. Cohen promised to Mr. Morris. And so that coming back before this commission and us seeing it, it's not clear to me entirely who sets the policy, whether it's 14 days or 30 days, and whether there's any oversight by any civilian or public body about how those records are shared. Perhaps that should come back to this body or that should go to the city council. That's something as a commission we could express some concern of and then that could somehow uh, go in a direction. And then I think um, related to that is um, that maybe that's for our annual report. Uh, and then finally, uh, something related to our retention uh, or the city's retention policy. So that being clear, so, uh, something that's uh, publicized, that, that is updated. Um, so I think those are some um, potential opportunities. But I think the other thing, you know, I, I'm trying to get back to and remember, again, thinking about restorative justice is what did the complainants say they needed? and or they think should happen and again they it was about like not having there be obstruction so what is it as the commission that is tasked with uh provide interpreting uh to some extent but really uh i'm trying to look at on my other screen the actual language from the ordinance but you know as the commission that's tasked with clarifying and supplementing uh these things um, what is it that we will be able to do? And so I think, you know, sustaining the complaint and then coming back with some of those particular uh, recommendations within the scope as a commission um, to provide guidance to the city council, asking for, you know, a, a report from the city attorney's office on how they are implementing the uh, Public Records Act um, so that, you know, this experience doesn't happen again. Is that a second to my motion, Commission um, Vice Chair Shabazz? No, ma'am. Uh, that would uh, uh, no Commissioner Reed. Uh, yeah, but I, I, can... I have a quick question for Chief Assistant City Attorney. Um, I remember Commissioner Loplato brought it up at the very beginning of the meeting, of, like the different ways we could go. There's founded, unfounded, sustained, I guess unsustained. But there's there's one. I forget which one was, was like, was it founded, unfounded with merit? Was that one of them? Because where it's like, hey, you know, in the black and white of things, you know, it's, if we just went, you know, with the, with the Miss Rogers interpretation, then, you know, this would be unfounded. But here as a commission, we're finding some merit to this complaint. Is that how that one's interpreted? I guess. Um, in answer to your question, I see there being three different um, options. One yeah. is you can sustain it. Okay. And that would mean that, well, that, that means that means you sustain it. Um, another choice is you choose to not sustain it. And then the third choice is to um, find it unfounded, which is this, which is, um, 
that you have concluded that it that it truly has no merit. That that ah uh, okay. It's, it's sort I, of I a, confused myself with yeah. no merit. I thought there's one where we could put where it's like, hey, your actual black and white complaint was unfounded, but there's merit to the complaint. Okay, I misinterpreted that. Yes, um, I did want to bring up one final point. Um, I. I can't remember during the, the flow of conversation whether the um, issue of timeliness was raised at, at a point when the parties who, when they were on Zoom, able to comment were, were present. Um, I know that several or a couple, I shouldn't say several, I think a couple of commissioners have noted um, the fact that the complaint itself didn't note the, the timeliness issue. Um, and I don't know whether, I, I just can't remember and if any of you do, but if, if any of you actually asked either, either side um, during the question period about the, the timeliness issue. I think there were some questions about that. I'm not sure if it was Commissioner Reed or Lo Palato actually asked um, Mr. Ross, you know, officially, when did you make this request and when did you hear back? And he said, and I think he said, oh, I think it was within 10 days, but I think it was our math as commissioners to say it wasn't. I think Mr. Ross felt that he got a response in time. And I think, because he said, I sort of don't remember, but I think, you know, it was within 10 days is what he said. Uh, okay, Ross, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to get into the merit. I'm, my job is not to get into the yeah, merit. I just want to make I, sure that what, parties have been heard on an issue that seems to, to be important to at least some commissioners in um, in their vote. So that's all. Yep, Commissioner Boss. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for clarifying. Um, um, you got a long title. Uh, we, we can just call me Ms. McKenzie or Elizabeth, it's fine. <laughs> thank you, Ms. McKenzie. So um, yeah, th uh, I wanted to uh, make uh, a comment and then I noticed that um, Mr. Morris uh, has his hand raised. Um, so I did uh, bring that question up during the clarifying portion, and I actually wasn't sure if we would have an opportunity to ask, like, I didn't know what the process was for the actual complaint. So I just asked one question, although I had others. Um, so yeah, that, uh, just to, to answer your uh, your question, I did raise that. That was one of my first, that was my first question, like, you know, whether it's 10 business days or calendar days. Um, so anyway, with that, um, I do recognize, or I can't recognize, I'm not the chair. Um, I noticed Mr. Morris uh, raised his hand, so I don't know if the process is where they could uh, respond, but it was in response to your question, Chair Tio, or it appeared to be. Um, I'll, I'll leave that up to the commission. Well, we do have a motion that was out there, and I believe we didn't get a second on that one. So does another commission want to try to make a motion and that will get seconded? I think my, my motion was, you know, lack of totality requests in an efficient manner. Um, and I remember Commissioner Lopalato did ask Chief Assistant City Attorney, you know, that language is used in the legal sense. And she came back sort of with a negative. And that's probably right, because like me and Vice Chair Shabazz, we're not lawyers, but we're trying to use the best um, definitions of, you know, words we can to sort of craft something here. Um, Commissioner LaPlata. Is there, uh, procedurally, is there any option here for us to hear from Mr. Morris on, I'm just curious if that's, uh, I don't know if the city clerk can speak to that, the chief yeah, I'll let, city um, attorney, but I think that's, that, that may be a big question. It's, it's uncomfortable to me to have a, a party in the room with sort of yeah, questions um, pending surround the goals of that yeah, party so and the um, students of that the party. City clerk, um, answer that one because we sort of, went past that part. I think it's, you know, it's our commissioner discussion time right now, but um, I'll leave it up to Madam Clerk. Yeah, I, I think it up, is up to the um, commission's prerogative. Um, you know, if you felt you needed more information, um, you are not prevented from asking additional questions of anyone. Commissioner LaPlata. I would move to hear from Mr. Morris on the question of, uh, whether he has concerns regarding the timeliness of the response to his his request. Second. Okay, Mr. Morris. I second it.
just as a point of information, or I don't know uh, <laughs> the parliamentary procedure. Oh, there goes Mr. Morris. I think as the chair, you could open it up after that. And I don't think it needs to be a motion in a second. Mr. Morris. Hey, um, I appreciate you uh, bringing me back in. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that from my perspective, the 10 day thing isn't really a big issue for me, but um, the fact of the matter is that the Public Records Act does have a requirement in it to produce for this agency to produce records promptly. And that's the word. And I think that that's kind of what has been dancing around. And I'm a little bit surprised that your assistant city attorney didn't mention this. Um, but the, the uh, fact of the matter is that when you talk about timeliness or you talk about efficiency, there is a requirement that like, once there's been a made a determination made that there's records available, that the records need to be produced promptly. And that's that's a legal term from statute. And I think that that's really what was violated here. Okay, I think I could, we could re replace efficient with promptly. And I think we're closer to motion. I, I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Mr. Morris. I see a hand by Vice Chair Shabazz, then I see you, Commissioner Chen. So. Let's get Vice Chair Shabazz and we'll go right to you. Yeah, I move to sustain Mr. Morris's complaint on the basis that the city did not respond to the request promptly. Uh, on that, can I add two words into that? You could say no, but um, in totality, prompt, does that work? I sort of want to throw the word totality in there. <laughs> Would you be in agreement or not in agreement? Yeah, man. I watch a lot of dystopian sci-fi, but I'm pretty anti-totalitarian myself. Okay. Um, uh, uh, then let's let's leave it alone then. So, so again, I think um, Commissioner Chen's comments, uh, however long ago that was, was like, you know, we're trying to, again, recognize that there was something that was not done uh, properly. Uh, the 10 days is one part. And again, that's about notifying. Again, as I shared with the Public Records Act information I was able to get, it was identified on April 15th that the records could be available internally within the city. But it wasn't until 12 days later that the information was uh, partially provided. And so, you know, I get that additional part y'all are speaking to, like there's some additional stuff that perhaps could have been provided at that time, but there was no immediate um that wasn't immediately uh, uh, distributed or, or disclosed. And so I think the initial piece is it was not responded to in a timely fashion. Then I think it's addressing these additional layers that I identified a little, a little while ago. But that's just my, my perspective and sort of part of the basis of that motion, which I think was made an hour ago by another uh, commissioner. All right, commissioner Chen. And I would like to second. Okay, sorry. Commissioner Chen. I'm reading the complaint, the actual complaint. And uh, unfortunately, the complaint uh, is, a, is a, appears to be a complaint about uh, the court decision that was cited. So I'm having this problem where someone comes to us with a complaint, we have to decide whether the complaint is sustained or not. Um, we find other things that went wrong that we could say are a violation of the Sunshine Ordinance. Is it valid for us to abandon the original complaint and go and say, but uh, <laughs> we found that uh, the city violated the, the Sunshine Ordinance. So I'm, I'm, that's, a, that's a legal question. I, I get where you're coming from, Commissioner Chan. I think that's why I sort of stated at the very beginning of the discussion. It's like, hey, that's more than being black and white. If we were doing the black and white and just follow the complaint, hey, a wrong citation was made, we could end it right there. If we, you know, what with Ms. Rogers is saying that, hey, he asked for 90 days worth of stuff, he got 90 days worth of stuff, we could throw this all out. But I, that's where I don't think we're following the spirit. I did second the complaint, by the way. I'd like to second the complaint. Oh, sorry, second the motion, I'd like to second the motion. Okay. Chief Assistant City Attorney. I'm just directing Chair Tilos that um, the city has raised its hand, her hand in the chat. The city. Uh, I thought special that's you. No, special <laughs> counsel. <laughs> Sorry. 
yes. Um, I guess I get to make the decision to hear. So, yes. We're, we're putting her in now. Yes, Ms. Rogers. Thank you, Chair Telos. Um, just to respond to the, the conversation you guys are, I, you guys are really grappling with some issues here. And I think on the timing front, it is absolutely, I think uh, uh, Chief Assistant City Attorney McKenzie is correct that the way time is calculated is if your deadline falls on the Saturday, it does bump to the Monday. This is common in the practice. Um, and so a response received on the 27th was absolutely timely um, under the, calcul the standard calculation of time. Um, and then, you know, what's I think really important to recognize is that in the materials that you have in front of you, the response that was provided on the 27th was a pretty fulsome explication of what was going to be required to produce a lot of these records, including the need to go through item by item to make sure that no juvenile records were included and that certain information was redacted. You know, as, as we've discussed already, and I think you guys, um, I've noticed you guys have already been discussing this, there is a very important privacy interest, especially for folks who have registered um, as victims of sexual assault or domestic violence or stalking. Um, and so all of these steps, you know, need to be carefully and diligently undertaken because, you know, the interest that a requester has has to give way sometimes to the, the right of the individual um, not to have their name or their height, weight, eye color um, disclosed in these in these records, which are highly detailed. And, you know, um, it, even here, I think it's, it is kind of important to recognize that Mr. Morris conceded he did not need all of the information that was going to be disclosed in these particular records. And, and the information is highly specific to the individual's physical characteristics, places them at a place um, on a date and time. And, and the production of these records, it really has to be very careful, right? It cannot just be that I, the click of a button, everything gets disclosed. That is not the way the department can do it. It's not okay. And so even though those records are available in hand, they still need to undergo that really rigorous and thoughtful, careful review. So just because the information is there doesn't mean that it's it's easily produced. And you know, depending on the amount of the request, I think here it's very common in the Public Records Act in this world of document requests for voluminous records to be produced on a rolling basis. And what that does is upon that, you know, timely response saying we've gotten your request, the city undertakes its process to begin to collect and diligently prepare uh, tranches of, of produced documents. And that's exactly what happened here. Now, the city lodged its position um, that there was no obligation to produce beyond a certain amount of time for contemporaneous records, but nonetheless, it did that. It went to the full extent, to the full length that it was, it was asked for documents. And they did ultimately produce everything that Mr. Morris requested. So um, I do, you know, just to help kind of flesh this out, I do think that the response um, by the city was timely here for purposes of the timeliness. And I also wanted to provide some additional factual um, information to guide your analysis of whether the uh, response on the part of the city was um, sufficiently uh, expeditious or efficient. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Commissioner Reed. So I'm not sure if, if everyone heard that I had seconded the motion. So I'm just wondering what is the procedure after a motion has been seconded? Did you want me to answer that? It, you can have discussion of the motion and also somebody could call for the question if they feel there's been enough discussion, um, which is um, another type of motion that somebody has to second and you have to have a vote to call for the question. Okay, great. I just want to clarify. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know, previous means too, we've had motions and uh, so I want to say when I first started chairing these meetings, I would go to the discussion before the motion just for this reason right here, because I don't want to have um, someone call, you know, call it real quick before everyone's point of view is out there. 
but then I guess that wasn't true parliamentary procedures. So then I started having the motions first, then to guide our discussion. And that's what we're sort of doing here. But now we fall in that trap again, where it's like, I think there's a motion out there and people sort of want to close the discussion. It's, I don't know how to balance this guy. I'm trying to figure it out with this um, crew of people we have here. I've tried both ways and also to try to make the meetings more efficient, but I never want to, you know, silence a raised hand. So I, I know we, we want to go on. I, I want to end the meeting as well too. And we still got two more agenda items, but that, that's just something I don't want to do is to, you know, have someone put a motion out there, have someone second and someone automatically just say, hey, let's vote on it when I still have three raised hands. That's just who I am. You know, you, you guys as commissioners, if you feel you need to just go ahead and do that and set it out there, I'm not going to object to it, but that's sort of how I sort of run things. But this is your guys' commission as well. So I just want to put that out there of why, you know, we, we go a little bit past, but I do want to hear every one of your raised hands. Um, Commissioner Reed. Um, yes. So, uh, so from from my point of view, the um, the complainant uh, did not uh, receive uh, the information that he requested in a promptly matter. So, um, in in that respect, I you know I respectfully um, request uh, this um, that uh, that we do sustain uh, the uh, the complaint. And okay. um, so I. I mean, I yeah, we have we have your second, right? So I appreciate the discussion and you know, etc. But um, I do think that it is you know it is our responsibility to ensure that when members of the public make a request, that the city does fulfill that request in a prompt mat you know in a prompt matter. Um, they knew what he was asking for. Um, they did not fulfill uh, his re you know uh, you know initially it was only the fourteen. Um, you know, the 14 days of data and then 16 days of data. And finally, after his insistence, after begging, basically, he finally got the full 87 days. And from my point of view, we can do better and we can do better for our citizens and, uh, and for anyone else who wants to um, do research on, um, on data that we have uh, in Alameda. Um, I think that this is important work. And, um, and I believe that members of the public should be able to have access. I mean, they, you know, this is a government agency. We all pay taxes to, um, to our government. So you know, there, there shouldn't be obstacles in the way. Um, in fact, our, our city staff should be accommodating and they should make sure that, hey, you know, are you getting what you need? Are you, um, you know, is there anything else that I can do to help you? So, um, you know, I feel like we should, uh, uh, we, should we should sustain this complaint. We have your second. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Um, <clears throat> I agree with everything Commissioner Reed said, but that's not what the complaint is. So, I'm having trouble and I need clarification from uh, Chief Assistant City Attorney, uh, whether there's a filed complaint and we want to sustain what? That complaint? If we sustain that complaint, it doesn't talk about the timeliness at all. See, I, I agree that we have to do better as a city to respond to public records complaints. That's clear, that's within our purview as the Open Government Commission, but not on this agenda. So- Yeah, I, no, I get, so, so it, I, again, it's- I, it, I keep, You know, I'm it's, looking at Again, the if, you're, you, if you're, exactly. Like I said, are you gonna look at it in black and white or are you gonna look at it in gray and how you vote is exactly, you know, how you're gonna vote. Okay, so I would vote. like to uh, make an amendment and just say, I, uh, based on the complaint, I move that we, um, it's not sustained. The, the complaint itself is not sustained. Well, that, that would be a motion, right? Yes, I move that. And then I'd also like to add to that. However, we found a lot of issues 
in how the complaint was responded to, which we as the Open Government Commission would like to explore further with the city attorney's office and the police department or you know whatever it is we wanna say. Because if someone complains about one thing and then we find fault with something completely different, it's kind of a real shaky thing. It's cleaner right. to say, well, you complained about this, that complaint is not sustained, but we found all these other problems uh, in hearing you out. And we want to address, and you know, we intend to address those those issues. And uh, Commissioner uh, Shabazz, you know, did point out how the city attorney had promised to work with him on a new policy and and all that. So, you know, it's kind of combining the two. I know yeah. I feel like Solomon, and here's half a baby. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I think that you know you you made valid points, and you're vote will reflect that um vice chair shabazz yeah thank you mr uh uh mr chair um so i i appreciate the point um I, what i understand from commissioner chin you know there's a complaint and it, it alleges x or y uh and then looking at what happened we see elemental p uh so and so do you have to make a determination of a violation, you know, solely based on what was, you know, put into the uh, complaint? Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think where I'm, um, because of how I think the complaint was used, uh, meaning initially, you know, there was a request, it was not, again, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm saying the same things over and over again. Um, you know, this complaint wasn't a response uh, timely based on the, uh, the, the law. I heard the opinions about Saturday, Sunday, all of that. And again, it says 10 days, calendar, not a court of law, not the civil code, not the vehicle code or whatever other stuff. I don't know about none of that. I just, from what I understand, the California uh, Public Records Act request, it says 10 days. And so based on that, there's a violation. But again, I understand Commissioner Chin, your point um, again, like this is what's in the complaint and this is what we found. Um, I'm ready to call the question. Uh, and then I also, yeah, I have maybe an alternate uh, solution. So I don't know if it's like, we should vote on this and I should tell you all this alternate thing, what I'm also hearing, but- Well, we, we did have a, your um, motion was brought yeah, to the floor, second. and we do have a second. Um, I'm ready to call for a vote. Um, thank you for your opinions too, Commissioner Chen. So, Madam Clerk, can we get a vote? Commissioner Chen. Uh, no. Lo Palato. No. Reed. Yes. Shabazz. Aye. Telos. Aye. That carries three to two. So we did have another motion that was out there from my Commissioner Chen. So I, I think wanna... that was a substitute motion. Um, it, it, oh, because uh, I don't think you can make alternate decisions. I, I don't think you can have two yeah. separate decisions. A point of order, I think I can make an amendment that would supersede I've had this done to me while I was chairing a meeting. So that's why I know this. <laughs> that, that once someone, someone makes an amendment, you vote on the amendment. That's, that's what the I, amendment has to be accepted by the mover and seconder. So I, I don't, I thought you were making a substitute motion. I'm sorry if I misunderstood procedurally what was happening, but I, I thought your motion was an alternate to what was voted on. So yeah, I, you know, I, it's okay. Okay. Commissioner Shabazz. Yeah, um, I don't want to uh, delay it and confuse it more. Uh, earlier, uh, you mentioned, you asked what that guy's name, uh, Robert, but there's also Roberta Rosenberg. It can be Rubens as well, a lot of R's. Um, what I was going to um, suggest, uh, the only language in the um, 
ordinance, sunshine ordinance related to the disposition of a complaint is unfounded. There's been recommendations for sustained. There's been recommendations not to sustain. And the suggestion I was going to um, share was uh, not the binary. So back to the, you know, put some color in there. Um, instead of sustained or unfounded or founded, just to say it has merit. Uh, and then based on the complaint having merit, we can then proceed to recommend uh, some of the particular cures that folks have also stated. So um, that was gonna be my, uh, my suggestion. And if there's support for that, I would be willing to move to reconsider the last vote and then move that. So that's a whole bunch I, of it. It may seem um, like some parliamentary trickery, but you know, the intention yeah. is to um, really capture more of this, um, the intention that I've, I've heard here um, where it's not just the complaint. So that is a valid, uh, uh, that would be a valid motion, but I, I just wanted to share that with you, Mr. Chair and the commission to try to resolve that concern. Okay, well, we, we did have a vote on this. I think the next part is to draft up the, the write-up for it. Right, Madam Clark? Um, yes, I, I think the motion had the um, reasoning in it, it, if I can, that it was a, um, that the request was, that it was not handled promptly. I think that was what it was based on the basis okay. that was used in the motion. Okay, well, let's get on to our next one. Um, it is before 10.30. So point of order. We, point we of order, can Mr. hear Mr. Chair? this. Yeah. I'm sorry, to, I'm not trying to interrupt you. Uh, I, I think that um, what also happened when I made my complaint related to the Public Records Act, there were recommendations based on like a cure and correct. And that is why I, I stated, you know, whether or not it's, sustained or just to say it has merit, you know, I'm more interested in, again, re the restoring part, which is to say, all right, what happens next? Okay, it's sustained, but what happened to that policy that was promised? What happens to, you know, the next request that comes in? Does the same thing happen? And so I think that that is also important to address. And so that's why, again, I'm saying like, if it can be addressed through the sustained, like it being sustained, let's do that. And if there is some merit to going back and just saying it has merit to get towards the same result, like I'm not really, whatever it's called, it's like, I don't want that to happen again. And that, I think that's what I heard and not just me, I, but I think people are like, let's not have that happen again. Let's not have it come back in an annual report. And it says it was voluntarily suspended on February 1st but then the complainant emailed the city on January 25th saying this thing was dishonest. So like, that's the thing that I want to address. And, again, and I think we addressed that to our, I guess, letter to city council as Commissioner Chen said, it's like, hey, how do we change policy? What are our recommendations? And, you know, that's, you know, I was going down your route a little bit when I asked for the three different things as far as like, with merit, unmerit, but I guess yeah. that wasn't, when I asked the chief assistant city attorney, she said, I misinterpreted that interpretation of it. Um, chief assistant city attorney. I was just going to chime in that, um, that to the extent that there's going to be any um, recommendation from, um, from the commission that um, as to any policy change, it will it will be a request to the council to make that policy change. I just want to clarify or confirm that. Okay, so that's something we can handle at a later meeting. It should definitely be something that's agendized, yes. Okay, great. Okay, um, I think we're closed on this one. It is 9.55, so we, could, um, we can hear another agenda item. We don't have to take a vote on it until it hits that 10.30 mark. 